Those, those are pluses. Please join me in a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen meeting, uh, October 23rd, 2017. We will start off with public comment period. Anybody here for public comment? Mr. Preston. Charlie Preston, 47 Glade Path, Hampton. I wanted to make this real brief, because I know there's nothing back and forth. It's just a quick comment. The town manager's report. Two, three, and four all address winter parking, the ban uh, during snow emergencies, parking is permitted in some municipal lots. Check section 805.5 of the town ordinance for online, online for specific details. We're requesting the state plow the beach lots and allow residents to park for free without paying fees November 15th to April 15th. That's the existing policy now. Um, over 10 years ago, we brought a petition of 225 people to the, right up to the governor's office. And, They've been getting, they've been doing better on it every year because way back they didn't have as much equipment as they do. Now they're, they, they're getting a lot more equipment. But I, I'm more interested in our own policy, and, and I don't know when the last time it was addressed as to what are the hours, because I can tell you, I mean, as you all know, I go by that lot down here you know, a dozen times a day, let's say. And it was plowed all last year, but it wasn't always open. Okay, I didn't understand why that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that lot should be open. 24/7. Maybe we need to look at what the policy is on it. I'm gonna just get in touch with the manager's office or you know look up online and and also that if it deviates from the policy, I would like to you know to find out who the point person is that people could call and say what's up. I also think that if we you know look at this and we start to consider an odd and even parking system, that we wouldn't have to have people vacate. I think it's eight o'clock in the morning now, which I think you know during a storm if there's you know, why do you even want people to go out if they don't have to go out, you know? The parking ban, we've, we've talked about other issues. There's ways to avoid that and also work with the plow operators to make it a better system. So I just, I just like to put it at that. I'm going to get in touch and, in, in, you know, sometime we'll talk aside and uh, if you want to make an appointment. But this is coming up real soon, November 15th. I would really like to see that town lot down there open. And, and really consider talk to the public works guys and uh, all the actual plow operators and say, have them park on the north side a lot on the odd days and the south side and the other, and work together. We can make this work better for everybody and keep people safely off the streets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else from the public wishing to be heard? Seeing none, we will go to announcements in community calendar. Regina? Nothing, Mr. Chairman. Rick? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, good news. Uh, Judge Casaza has a birthday coming up very soon. He uh, he looks almost as good as Mr. Welch. So uh, a happy birthday to uh, Judge Casaza coming up. Uh, on the downside, uh, uh, Jerry Sterrett, uh, Hampton resident and uh, lifelong businessman in Hampton. Uh, he is no longer with us, and uh, God bless him. And on this day, importantly, uh, 23 October, uh, our good friends, uh, uh, the terrorist group Hezbollah, Iranian-sponsored terrorist group, uh, took the lives of 241 Marines. Uh, sailors and soldiers in the Marine barracks and 66 paratroopers in an adjacent building down the street. Uh, our, uh, our memories are with them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I just won Halloween in Hampton. Come join the Hampton Rec Department for some ghoulish games and frightening fun. Don't forget to dress up in your favorite costume. Once the outdoor fun is done, stop by the Kona ice truck for a terrific treat. The fun includes put pumpkin putt-putt, pumpkin beanbag toss, Halloween scavenger bingo, candy corn bowling, popping pumpkins. The date is Friday, October 27th. Time is 5.30 to 7. Ages 3 to 12. Location is at the Tuck Building. Please RSVP to the Rec Department by calling 926-3932. And Trick-or-treating in Hampton is Tuesday, October 31st from 5.30 to 8. So all you people who will be going trick-or-treating, make sure you do it that night. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. 
I just want to point out that one of our uh, board of selectmen is having a birthday next week, and they're not going to be here. And it's a big birthday. I just want to say happy birthday to Mr. Bean. So Mr. Mr. Bean is joining the old people. Thank you. Alka Zosman and I are the same age. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, consent agenda. Termination of lease, 12 River Avenue, map 296, lot 82. New land lease, 12 River Avenue, map 296, lot 82. Taxi licensed, a Surfside Taxi, Lawrence LaFond. Motion to move the consent agenda. Second. Regina, seconded by Rick. All in favor? Passes unanimously. Appointments, trustees of the trust quarterly report. I see two of you here. If you want to join us at the table. Introduce yourselves and give us the good news. Bill Hartley, Vice Chair. John Sovich, just a member of the committee. I want to point out that we're still going up. Uh, and the reason we're going up is the 40% we have invested in equities, stocks. Uh, because the uh, years ago, the entire fund was invested in fixed income. And Five or six years ago, we changed to 40% stocks and 60% are bonds. And if you look at the front page of the uh, handout, the Real Estate Investment Fund, and you look at the last column, you see five years ago, the fund was $17 million. And today, it's $21.5 million. All that is due to the 40% we're investing in equities. And so we need to keep that in mind when the stock market has a correction, because someday it will, probably next year. And when it goes down, you have to remember all the years that it went up before everybody starts screaming that it's gone down, because it has to go down. It can't go up forever. and. Uh, uh, Bearing Point uh, is our advisor. Bearing Point keeps the uh, equities diversified, which is really essential because we used to invest in individual stocks and we did not have a good uh, result. But by diversifying into mutual funds and having many, many uh, individual stocks, uh, we take less risk. And uh, <coughs> The bonds are diversified as well, except we do have some individual companies' bonds, and we do that because it's more difficult to manage bonds in a mutual fund. So we have some of them in individual bonds. And uh, we work hard at, at managing this fund. We meet four times a year, and the meeting lasts probably an hour, an hour and a half. And the work is done ahead of time because we get the reports ahead of time. And the main job is done by our advisor. And our advisor does the work by diversifying and by producing results. And we have very few mutual funds that are negative. Every once in a while we do, but not, not right now. And so if you look at the results here, I don't think there's anything anybody would complain about. Uh, we do have a suggestion. Uh, John is, is, this is his last meeting he's going to attend. Uh, he's retiring from the board. And uh, uh, Norm Silverdeck is retiring from the board in March. And John has a suggestion 
that has been bothering him for a while, and he would like to present it to you. Well, what bothers me, and I brought it up at our last meeting, is I did not fully, I, I don't think that Towns folks are fully aware of what the impact is uh, having this trust fund. There's a lot of people don't even know there's a trust fund. Um, there certainly are groups that are, are well aware of it, but if something, just as a, a thought, something could be put on that on the tax return every year that says uh, without the trust fund, your taxes would be seven hundred thousand dollars higher or something like that to make people aware that it's even there. Um, maybe something along that line. I don't think you can break it down to say individually it would be too much work, but you just put a, put a number on the on the tax form or put it out on the website or something so people are aware that we even have one. Um, as Bill said, this is um, I've been on the board six years and I'm the short term person there. Everybody else has been on longer. Uh, so we do have two positions that are going to open uh, for next year and we're looking for a few good men or women to uh, come and, and uh, put their name in the hat and continue the tradition of uh, what's gone on and uh, with some good results. You can see the last five years investment gain has been oh, six and a half million. The town's got almost uh, three and a half million dollars of that. So it's a great asset for the town of Hampton. Uh, people should know that it's there and that it does perform. Uh, we probably are looking uh, for about the same results as the last 12 months, somewhere in the 700 to $750,000 range again this year, um, with the increasing value of the fund. Thank you. We're pretty proud of the fact that we can produce to the town almost three quarters of a million dollars in a year. And, and uh, we hope that the townspeople appreciate that. We know it won't happen every year, but the last couple of years, We've, we've had that good results. And I'm here for any questions. Virginia? Um, I agree. I think that it definitely is something that needs to be mo more known about. I mean, three quarters of a million dollars is a lot of money, and not a lot of places make that in a year. So great job. Thank you. Rick, yes. Thank you. Well, thank you both for your uh, efforts and all the good work that you've done. Um, if I'm not mistaken, we're not allowed to put stuff like that on the tax bills, okay. uh, right? Yes, but we can put it on the website. Yes, so that's a good good suggestion. But we've been through this before about putting up in, all sorts of little things Dang, that we could okay. put, and the state doesn't allow it. Right. But the uh, website is well, I think a lot of people keep up with it. It's very well read. Phil? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, and John, thank you for your service. Um, when you're leaving and Norm's leaving, uh, after riding this bull so well, uh, you're making me nervous, so. Um, <laughs> well, um, thank I think, you. I think we have very little to do with it. It's mostly our advisor that uh, provides the input, so he'll I, still I, be here. I, I, I appreciate our humility, your humility, but uh, when you go back to uh, 2008, uh, you have, uh, uh, ridden that bull to almost $9 million, $8.75 million you've, you've ridden that. You've outperformed Harvard uh, in their portfolio. Um, you have changed um, uh, money pushers and money handlers, if you will. There's been a transition. You've done that very well. Uh, Norm Silberdick has done an exceptional job. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, you have, and your, uh, your, your group has. On the serious note, I, and I know you have these discussions, and it's not easy, is do you get off that bull and ride it out, and then the thing goes to, uh, you know, 30, 3,000, 20, 30,000. So you, those are those decisions that you face. They're not easy. I know you do it well with experienced uh, professionalism, and you do so with your advisor, and it, it's not an easy task, but you have a remarkable, remarkable record. So thank you very much, and please extend our thanks to Norm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank yeah. you. Great report. <laughs> I mean, there, there aren't many, uh, any other towns in New Hampshire probably that have $21 million in a trust fund. I mean, it's, it's I don't a, think so. I don't think so, no. And it's a super uh, way to get uh, income and to keep the tax rate, help keep the tax rate down. I have one question, and it's not a negative, it's just a question. Okay. Did you have much exposure to Puerto Rico in no. bonds? No. <laughs> We're not in Puerto Rican bonds or anything else. No, no good. Uh, if it is, if there's anything, it's minimal, but we don't, we don't have any. Yeah.
Good. Well, great report, and thank you very much for the report, and sorry to see you leave. We picked up Venezuela instead. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't have that either. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Chris Jacobs, DPW Director, and Jen Hale, DPW Deputy Director, A, Reconstruction of the Ice Pond Dam. Good evening. And with you for the public is, we all know him. Yep. Fine, upstanding gentleman. J.D. from the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Oh, I didn't know you wanted me to introduce him. I said, oh, geez, everybody knows him. Uh, first item on the agenda uh, that we're bringing forward is uh, we're working with the Conservation Commission on the uh, reconstruction of the Ice Pond Dam. Uh, a number of years ago, um, early when they wanted to uh, started the process to reconstruct the dam, at that time we had looked at and wanted to use the uh, granite abutments that were on Drake Side Road, but they just weren't available to us at that time. Their project was proceeding before that project. As things work out, their project did not proceed. Um, back in 2015, it was bid, and um, they received two prices, 228000 and some change, and 318000 and some change, and that was well in excess of what they could um, afford. Um, the same contractor that we had work on Drake Side Road has approached us and said, hey, you've got the granite. This is the granite that we wanted to use before. Matter of fact, we've pre-positioned about 12 pieces of granite over on uh, Woodland Road next to the Ice Pond Dam. Uh, he's given us an in-writing proposal of $46,645, uh, all-inclusive, to essentially um, rebuild that dam. Um, using those granite blocks and um, we're going to essentially use the the same technology or plans that we were going to use before uh, dig it down to a ledge uh, drill and pin it and then they pour what they call mud slab which is just basically a level slab and then we're going to work up from there the the plan that is approved by des the wetlands bureau has used uh, i believe it was an earthen core and some concrete uh, we've communicated to them. They said, fine, um, this this design modification is equally as efficient, um, probably will look more natural than what was proposed before, disturb less area. Um, they've said no modification is necessary to what they gave before, proceed with the same permit. Um, so we're here to ask you for permission to uh, work with Northern New England Field Services. Of course, this board would have to sign the contract um, and the, the bill, matter of fact, Jay could speak to it. Um, they've raised or appropriated the money to cover the bill, so this is a, I want to say, a non, um, it's no exposure to the public works budget. Without, it's a little to none. All right, Jay, you've had yes. the board? Uh, we have, um, the Conservation Commission has a conservation fund, and that fund is designated via RSA for use in acquiring conservation land, conservation easements, and maintenance of those properties. And this clearly falls under maintenance of one of the town conservation properties. So the Conservation Commission has taken a vote and um, has allocated uh, the monies that we need out of that fund to pay for this project. So Chris is absolutely right. The cost would be borne entirely by the Conservation Commission. For a motion, Mr. Chairman. That's a, it's, a, it's amazing. What was the original price? About 218 was the lowest bid. 228. And now we're going to do it for? 46. 46,000. 46,000. Because we're using, you know, our own materials yeah. and um, uh, we have a no-nonsense contract. You just, you know, literally was going to handle this in a straightforward approach that they did at Drake Side Road and that is, you know, it's no frills. Break it down to simply what it is and and do it. As and, matter of fact, and they did a really good job down at Drake Side. You're, it, you're totally exactly pleased it's, with them and it's done and it's paid. Right. Yeah. Super. I've heard that the the residents um, at Hampton Meadows. I heard some this week to say how much how nice it is. Yep. I imagine it. It was a major safety concern and it's been eliminated now. Right. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, I did put together, if, if anyone wants, a suggested motion to approve that may cover uh, what you'd want to state. Yeah. Does anybody have that? From the, director. Uh, the Board of Selectmen recommend that the town accept the quote provided by Northern New England Field Services LLC in the amount of $46,645 for the Ice Pond Dam reconstruction with the understanding that the funding has been approved by the Conservation Commission and the Department of Public Works will provide project oversight. I'll make that motion. Okay. Second. Okay, all in favor? Super. Uh, purchasing policy and purchasing procedures with waiver section 718-4B1 and 2. Thank you, Jay. Thank, Thank you, you very Jay. much. Uh, snowplow bid 2017-014 snowplowing Jamco. That is what is before you. Back in August, we accepted bids for the snow plowing contract that we've put out for the past few years. And uh, similarly to the last few years, we've received one bid. Um, there's been a small delay in getting this in front of you, and that's strictly just because of everything that's going on. And it hadn't, we hadn't thought snow back in August. Um, not saying I'm thinking about it now, but didn't want to wait any longer. Uh, so we're here to uh, go ahead and ask the authorization for the town manager to uh, sign a contract with Jamco based on their bid prices that were provided in, in their bid uh, and use that contract for a duration from October 23rd of 2017 through April 15, 2018, covering this upcoming winter season. Uh, any 18 uh, monies would obviously be out of an 18 budget, okay. uh, but just had to say that as the contract would go over the years. Uh, it does not comply with the purchasing policy because we did only get one bid, but we did send it out uh, to the 10 bidders. That's required under the purchasing policy. And how many did you send it out to? We sent it out to 10, went on the town website, went on our public website, and we got one. Got one. And, and their prices? Um, very reasonable, in line with last year, a few, a few changes um, in dollars, but they're n uh, nowhere near exorbitant to others that I have seen. Rick, any questions? Phil? Mr. Chairman, pending your comments, uh, I would move that we accept the uh, hourly rate and proposal and the 13 October 2017 memorandum to Fred Welch from the uh, Director of Public Works and Jen Hale, the Assistant Director, uh, on the bid tabulation. Second. Second. All in favor? Cool. Uh, that's it for you guys, huh? It is. Easy. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. Try to keep it short for you. John Hurley, Carl McMorran, uh, Aquarian Water Company. Update on PFC in Wells. Welcome. Thank you. With me tonight, let's do ten things at once. Is uh, John Hurley, he's Vice President for Water Quality, and Dan Lawrence is our uh, Director of Engineering. Good evening. The turn over to John to lead off. Uh, thank you for letting us come and give you an update this evening. I'm going to talk primarily about PFCs, but first I wanted to let everybody know that uh, we issue a water quality report every single year. Uh, it's available to all customers and the public on our website, aquarionwater.com. Uh, go to New Hampshire, go to water quality, and select water quality report. And in this report, we talk about where the water comes from, we talk about how to protect water, how to save water, and we also talk about uh, what's in the water. And we test our drinking water for about 100 compounds. Uh, this table of the regulated compounds that have been detected indicates that there are 14 of those 100 compounds detected. And we tell you what the levels are, we tell you what the standards are, we also have information in here about unle unregulated parameters that EPA has us monitor for from time to time. And this includes the PFCs, the data on the PFCs that we started testing for in 2014 and have tested for each year since then. So AquarionWater.com, every year customers in the second quarter of the year get a notice in their bill saying that the report is available on the website. 
and if they would like to have a report mailed to them, they just have to contact us and we'll send the report. So on to the PFCs. On the website, is that a PDF that they can download or just? Yes. It is. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. So uh, we're going to start with a, we're going to quickly go through some of the uh, items that uh, went through last month. So just a refresher on how our system works, where we get the water from, how it moves through the system, uh, what PFCs are, uh, some an update on the monitoring that we're doing, the data that we've obtained in the month of September, both in our the drinking water that uh, the customers receive and also in our production wells. And then in addition to the monitoring, what are we doing about the PFC issue? And that includes our investigation of the uh, groundwater pollution and also our treatment alternatives analysis for the Mill Road Well Group. So the water comes from a, a group of 16 wells, and we have uh, the Winnicott uh, Well Group up here. Ten of the 16 wells are uh, stratified drift or overburden sand and gravel aquifer wells, and six of them are bedrock wells. Uh, so in the Mill Road group, uh, we have two bedrock wells and four sand and gravel. These three individual contributors are all sand and gravel wells, and then uh, uh, four of the six up of the seven up here in Winnicott uh, are also sand and gravel. So we, we have a mixture of both types of wells. Per fluorochemical, so that's what PFC means. So these are manufactured compounds. They're not naturally occurring like some of the other contaminants that you can find in drinking water like arsenic and barium uh, that can come out of the bedrock. Uh, and they're found in a number, a wide array of chemicals uh, in, in commerce. You find them in, in your homes. Uh, they're in firefighting foams, they're in car wax, uh, in the homes, you can find them in your Teflon pans, uh, stain and fire resistant fabrics, carpet care liquids, pre-treated carpets, floor waxes and sealants, and treated upholstery. Uh, they have been found through testing in uh, ambient water as well as drinking water, uh, in soil, uh, house dust, and food, and also in human blood. So these are considered an emerging contaminant. There are no enforceable standards uh, at EPA level, um, and different states are setting uh, guidelines and enforceable standards. EPA has a health advisory limit of 70 parts per trillion for just PFOA and PFOS, so that's perfluorooctanoic acid and perfluorooctane sulfonate. Those are both eight carbon uh, uh, PFCs. So these PFCs are chains of carbon atoms that have a different number of fluoride atoms attached to them and then some other uh, acid and sulfonate groups. Uh, they're, we're, they're measured at very, very low levels, parts per trillion. Most of uh, the parameters that we test for and detect are at a part per billion level. Uh, or part per million. These are at part per trillion, so very, very low. And there's a 70, 70 part per trillion standard just for PFO and PFAS. So this map uh, shows the levels that we're finding in the drinking water. I have a map after this that shows what we're finding in our production wells. So the idea, the lines on this map are our are, are primary uh, water mains. So there's a lot of mixing that goes on in the system, and the the blue tri the blue triangles are uh, actual sampling points in the distribution system. So, for example, uh, we have the Rye Store up here, and we have the Northampton Firehouse, uh, we have the Mill Road tank here, and the Exeter Road tank here, and you can see that you know, compared to that standard of 70 for PFOA and PFOS, these numbers are very very low. Uh, 0 0.73 down here and 4.2 for the distribution locations. And some of the wells have uh, higher levels up to 7 here. This is the Mill Road group. Uh, this is well 6, which is off, and it's been off since August 14th. But the levels are very, very low compared to the standard. 
in terms of total PFC, so the, the uh, laboratory analysis tests for 14 different PFCs. And so when you look at the total PFCs, the numbers are a little bit higher. Uh, there's a 17 here uh, coming out of well 14, and there's a, the 0 0.7 down here at the, uh, the Tide Mill uh, PRV. Uh, so uh, a bit higher than uh, just looking at PFO and PFOS, but still very low compared to the uh, 70 part per trillion standard. Uh, so now, so th those levels were the levels detected in, in our September monitoring. Uh, this page describes the, uh, all the results in 2017. So we've monitored in, in uh, June, twice in August, and again in September. And September was the first monitoring set for a six consecutive month monitoring program that we initiated this month. So we're monitoring each month from September through February. So when we get to February, we'll have those six months plus August and June to take a look at how the levels, uh, what, where the levels are, how consistent are they, how, how do they vary, and, and we have some graphs that we'll be able to demonstrate uh, to you for that. So here's, here's one of those graphs. So this is, again, the drinking water that customers receive and just PFO and PFOS, the two regulated compounds. The red line at the top is EPA and New Hampshire standard of 70. Uh, New Jersey has enacted a standard of 40 just for PFOA. So their total of uh, PFO and PFOS is still 70, but only 40 of that can be PFOA. Uh, and then down here we have the 20 standard that Vermont has put in place for a particular area in Vermont. So here are our, the six locations in the distribution system that we are now monitoring, and we'll have six months' worth of data when we get to February. So the, the Mill Road tank, the Exeter tank, the Tide Mill uh, pressure reducing valve, the Maple Road uh, valve, the Northampton Fire Station, and the Rye Store. Uh, this line here is 10 parts per trillion, and you can see all of these numbers for PFO and PFOS are well under 10. So they're like uh, one-tenth of the uh, standard uh, that is currently in place for PFO and PFOS. Again, total PFCs, like I showed you on the maps, are a little higher than that, but still very low. Uh, now let's take a look at PFO and PFOS levels that are in the Mill Road wells. So, uh, and here we've been testing uh, well six, and so for the, the last three monitoring periods, you can see that uh, these levels are about 25 uh, parts per trillion, but they're very consistent the, the last three times we monitored, not much variation. Here's well uh, A day. This is the well uh, with 20 and 21 uh, that are in Northampton. Uh, and very low levels, less than 10, and, and this is not much variation to speak of. Again, when you're at five parts per trillion or less, uh, the labs uh, do not certify that the number they report is exactly that number. It's somewhere between 0 0.5, let's say, and four plus parts per trillion. So that's not really variation. Same thing here with well nine and well 11. Uh, these four are the stratified drift overburden wells. And then wells 20 and 21 are the bedrock wells, very, very low uh, levels. So now uh, for all of 2017, for total PFCs uh, in the production wells, the uh, PFO and PFOS, none detected up to 25. 25 is well 6, which is offline. And uh, for total PFCs, none detected in some of the wells up to 88. And again, that was earlier this year in well six, which is offline. Uh, now I want to talk about what other actions Aquarion is taking to address the PFC. So we've got all that monitoring of the drinking water and the production wells in place. That's going to continue. We've also been working very closely with uh, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services 
on a pollution monitoring investigation. And the purpose of that is to protect our production wells. So uh, our Mill Road wells are over here. Uh, we know we're finding PFCs there, especially in well six. Uh, that's what's known. What's not known is what, what's out here, what's heading towards our wells. And, and we're doing additional monitoring with the state to uh, determine that. Is there a contamination plume? Where is it? How high are the levels in that plume? What rate is that plume advancing toward, towards our production wells? Okay, so that's why we're doing this investigation. DES has been in the lead on the investigation. Uh, they've identified a number of uh, potential pollution sources. Uh, they have been doing some sampling. A few of the results are in. Uh, but these, these red boxes here are uh, locations that are uh, operations that uh, could be contaminating uh, the groundwater with a number of different types of parameters, not necessarily PFCs. Uh, but we, you know, we do a report and we update it every three years on the status of potential pollution of the groundwater. These locations are in that report. Uh, and so uh, Brandon Kernan of DES has uh, reported some of the data, uh, the data that he has. It's all on uh, the DES website. And he's also sent an email recently uh, uh, indicating, uh, talking about their program, but also indicating uh, that they have found uh, PFCs at several locations in this area, including the airfield and the car wash. Uh, he has sampled a number of other locations. Uh, those results are pending, and when they come in, he'll be sharing them with us. Uh, the, uh, and he's also indicated that the, he's found significant levels uh, of PFCs at the car wash, lower levels at the airfield. But again, this is that's just a couple of locations. There are many more uh, that need to be uh, sampled and tested and have the results uh, compared to the results we already have. Um, okay, so now this is a map uh, showing a number of uh, private wells and a few monitor wells. So, uh, and this is the whole system here, the, you know, well 5A and Rye up here, uh, our Mill Road wells, well 7 in Hampton, uh, Winnicott up here, well 14. Uh, so we're, we're first focused on Mill Road, but we're, we, we want to know, are there uh, contaminants heading towards any of our production wells, PFC contamination? So uh, we have hired a, a hydrogeologist. He's working closely with us and DES. Uh, so we are identifying pollution sources for all of our production wells. But also, uh, we're working with DES on a plan to sample, hopefully, on the order of 50 uh, private uh, wells and, and monitor wells that may already be out there to determine the uh, scope and level of contamination uh, in our whole public drinking water system. So uh, we uh, are working with DES to decide exactly which uh, wells to monitor. We have to send, uh, Brandon uh, DES is going to be sending postcards asking people to participate. They're going to collect the samples, send them to the laboratory, get the results back and report them. We are going to help pay for the cost of the testing. And this testing will be with the 26 component scan. Currently we're at 14. Uh, we've collected our, our October set from our drinking water and production wells, sent it to the lab. When that report comes back, that'll be 26 compounds reported on. And this monitoring of the water in the aquifers will also be uh, 26 compounds. And that will, it's more expensive, but that will help us hopefully uh, establish a footprint uh, for what we're finding out in the aquifers compared to what we're finding in our production wells and see if we can make a connection. Uh, once that is done, the next step would be for New Hampshire DES to 
uh, work with pollution sources to abate uh, the contamination of the waters of the state, the groundwater. Uh, so I've covered the, the first three action items, and the last one that we want to report to you tonight is on the uh, treatment uh, assessment evaluation, and Dan Lawrence, our Director of Engineering, is going to speak to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, good evening. So we retained the consultant tie-in bond to complete an alternative analysis right around September when all this started to come forward. And we wanted to evaluate treatment options for PFCs detected in the Mill Road well field. So it's focused right now just at Mill Road. When John just talked about taking samples throughout the community, that's about figuring out if, is there going to be another place where we may need to treat um, and making sure that we cover everything, not just something we see today. But we want to take a look at that um, possibility for treatment. We want to look at the costs. We want to look at the alternatives. Um, we are looking at um, a couple different options. And we're also looking at the potential. You have the PFOA and PFOS, which is the acronyms for uh, those particular compounds that are presently regulated, as well as the possibility of looking at total PFCs for treatment. So we're looking at both the regulated compounds and the entire suite of compounds right now. And the differential in cost and potentially technology to either treat all or a few um, under different scenarios. Um, so that includes right now well six, as John mentioned, is off and has the highest concentration of around 25, still below, but the total PFC number I believe is 86 right now. And we do have some sources close. So we're looking at combinations of alternatives combined with um, combination of wells. Um, if we can uh, you use the expression blend a little bit, so get some cleaner water, get some less water, treat that, and be more efficient with that. We want to look at that as well. So we have a draft report from our consultant that was submitted um, to us uh, about a week and a half ago. We provided comments to our consultant. They've revised that report for us and resubmitted it to us for final review. Um, that came in last Friday. We're going through the final review of that report right now. Um, with that, we are also doing uh, taking the, both the capital and expense costs and looking at potential rate impacts to customers for each of the alternatives that we look at. Um, and I think that's a really important piece of information for the community to have and for us to understand with you. So we, we promise to bring that report to you on or about November 1st, 2017, as, and we are on schedule for that. So with that, and I know there was a discussion at a, at a recent meeting, um, we understand also that there's funding that could pot potentially be available to address some of the costs. Um, I, we met with uh, Brandon Kerner from New Hampshire um, DES today. Um, he knew a little bit about the program, but he wasn't in charge of the program. So I'm going to be reaching out to and figuring out who to speak to and figuring out both the program, eligibility, how the money is distributed, and what type of funding there actually is. I know where the money comes from, but we're uh, at this point not entirely clear which, which program it's running through, whether it's running through the drinking water program, um, it is part of the Drinking Water and Groundwater Trust Fund, but how they choose to establish that is something I need to resolve and figure out. So that's where we are with that right now. Um, and uh, that is the, our presentation. We'd love to uh, take questions from the board if you have any. Regina? Um, I just sort of want to verify something. So you're saying that the tests that you did for September were not, there was no really substantial variances from the prior month. Correct. Pretty much everything's leveled out, and you're going to continue to test, and you're going to continue to look for who the pollutants are, and then once found, you're going to deal with that, and maybe some source of funding would. Right. So, Carl, can you switch back one slide for me? So that, although I, I realize everything looks good on a graphic when you look at it on your desk, um, there are a bunch of. Um, black circles up there trying to identify groups of private wells. There's a number of private wells. Um, New Hampshire DES provided us a uh, shape file for GIS, which is the ability to see all the um, existing private wells that exist in the area, both in within our system and without. And that enables us to look at potential sampling locations to look at where is the, where might PFC contamination come from. So right, we're not seeing a large variance right now, but we want to continue to look to make sure we understand what's happening. And we're going to do that with DES while we look at funding 
while we do an alternative analysis and kind of do everything concurrently. Um, so if that makes it does. answers your question. Thank you for the summary. You're welcome. Rick? No? Thank you. Bill? Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it very, very much. Um, I got in the mail today addressed to Philip W. Bean uh, a letter from the uh, Camp Lejeune Historic uh, Drinking Water uh, Organization. And what that is is from, and, and, and pardon me if I don't accept government uh, uh, and company and corporate uh, assertions about safety and subjective terms about how things are low. Uh, and I was up at Concord this week. A member of the commission was removed from the gov uh, from, from that an appointee by the governor was removed from the commission uh, on the uh, cancer cluster uh, commission. Uh, there's been uh, op-ed by a former selectman in this town uh, 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 debunking assertions that uh, there are uh, serious threats to our water. Uh, this letter I received is from 1953 to 1987. Uh, there were carcinogens uh, dumped into the water in a uh, Department of Defense installation in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, where I and my family and my siblings and my brother lived and drank the water. There's about 10 different cancers. There's uh, um, myriad uh, diseases. Uh, this goes back to 1953 through 1987 when they finally, finally shut it off. It was not acknowledged. Uh, and uh, children were dying. And uh, trust me, uh, I have no confidence that uh, without the kind of involvement uh, under uh, the chairman's leadership, uh, some of the local scientists and the legislators uh, and the efforts uh, in this town of people uh, to protect themselves. I went to the um, state of New Hampshire, the lobbyist uh, website, uh, Eversource Energy, which is going to be the uh, parent company of yours. Is that correct? Okay. If approved by all okay. the regulatory oh, yeah, It's going to be yes. approved. Trust me. I sat in the meetings, and I support it. Uh, I do. Uh, I'm going to read uh, um, some, some numbers. And this is July of 2017. Up to that point, uh, Eversource had spent $47,000 lobbying inside uh, uh, the Capitol building uh, with different firms up here. I'm not going to name the firms. Uh, Eversource, again, on another uh, lobbyist, $43,000. You've got sister corporations that are up there, some of them that we have issues with. The grand total for utilities, and we've got another issue coming up with utilities uh, later on, um, uh, uh, perhaps under old business from the chairman's letter, uh, 253000 of full-year lobbying is going uh, to Concord uh, legislators. We sit here, um, and we uh, have transparency obligations to our citizens uh, under state law. Uh, this uh, kind of funds transfer to influence legislators, to influence government regulators, uh, is inside baseball. And we don't know what's going on. And I would say to you, and I have been down to see Mr. Hunt in Boston on my own time, uh, disclosed to this board, uh, to see Mr. Hunt from Eversource. And I would like a pledge to you folks uh, that money that is invested in this lobbying, that a good percentage of it goes to protect uh, uh, remediation of the Coakley Landfill Group, the uh, doctor at uh, the Department of Environmental Services at our Cancer Cluster Commission last week emphatically stated uh, that that is a cancer cluster. There were four childhood cancers out of 350 nationwide around that, that Coakley Landfill Group. A mother of one of those children testified at the meeting. So. There's a huge problem here, and when we have high limits of 70, and we've shut down a well, and we hear tonight from you, very esteemed and honest gentlemen, that um, the rate, the, the levels are low, uh, it's because the limits are so high. And 70 is a very high limit, and there'll be legislation up in Concord and a push to protect ourselves. And I'm going to pontificate on this issue because uh, uh, I was at that hearing last week, and it was very emotional. And there were grown men and women um, in that. In the, on that commission that were in tears. And the governor immediately terminated one of the members um, that asserted differently. Uh, this past week, there was, uh, on the Sunday, 22 October, from Dabra Seekin. She was refuting an op-ed by um, Mr. Fred Rice, a former state rep and a, a former um, selectman here, who asserts that uh, um, otherwise of, of the general notions that I'm asserting. Um, 
Deborah, who is a uh, hydrologist, asserts that PFCs do not break down easily, so once they are in our environment or our bodies, they stay there for a long time. They are implicated in causing cancer, immune dysfunction, development delays, liver and thyroid effects. Vermont advises against drinking water with no more than 20 parts per trillion PFCs. More stringent state regulatory limits for contaminants are not set for political reasons, but are based on science, just like the EPA limits are. Based on the limited sampling conducted for PFCs, Coakley Landfill is known to be leaching up to 2,586 parts per trillion. Say that again, 2,586, and this is according to a hydrologist from Dover. This concentration was detected this spring in a leachate sample collected from a seep in the landfill. And I'm getting nods from both of you. You've read the data. Okay. One of the, and the public hasn't, and this is our no, job no, to educate I, them. I, yeah. one, of, one of the PFCs, PFNA, was detected at the second highest concentration detected in the world in any surface water body. There is a PFC issue at the landfill. PFCs have been detected at very high levels in deep bedrock wells in the landfill, and the deep bedrock groundwater flow regime has not yet been adequately investigated. There was a deep bedrock groundwater study in the queue for Coakley. You talk tonight about you're going to be more ambitious in your testing in bedrock, some of these other sites that may, like a car wash that may at the airport that may, may be uh, involved. So we're, we're enthusiastic about that. Uh, we're going to stay on this issue. We thank you. I am encouraged by uh, Eversource's uh, stock transfer and uh, um, acquisition of you, if you will. Uh, Mr. Hunt assured us that he would participate that. And I want to be, I want a, 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 a firm uh, avenue of approach through the chairman and through this board and through our, our representatives that this huge amount of influence peddling, which isn't always bad if it's in our interest to keep our water clean and to keep children from dying, is not used against us. And I, and I want that affirmation, and I want to see some nodding of heads and some agreement to that from you folks. And you won't do it, and you can't do it, and I get it, and I'm putting yeah, you on the yeah. spot. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't want to see that kind of money uh, coming back to oppose people that want limits as low as Vermont. Because I'm of the assertion, and I'm of the belief, uh, having been through this before, okay, um, is that they should be the lowest in the nation. And there's good science to back that up. And there'll be legislation in there to do that. So I'm interested in you providing to the board um, your exact testing, uh, detailed. We'd like a copy of this, if I may, Mr. Chairman, a copy of this PowerPoint. We'd like uh, a detailed uh, uh, synopsis of your uh, testing efforts going forward. We'd like a copy of your communications with the Department of Environmental Services. Uh, we'd again like a response, if, if I may speak for the board, that this quarter million dollars uh, annual of, of influence by lobbyists in Concord is not used against the interests of people consuming your product. And, and we'd like, we'd like uh, uh, a guarantee of that. And if not the case, we would like, in the, in the uh, opposition to that, we would like to know if you are spending money to oppose legislation to keep cancer levels PFAs, PFOAs, in our drinking water, uh, closer to the levels they're at now, and I think that's fair baseball. I, I, I just really do. Yeah. And, and I don't need a response now. But I wasn't going to give you. I was just going to say our alternative analysis yeah. looks at multiple levels of uh, down to twenty, and, and so we, we we didn't take the seventy as where we're going to end up in life. I, I got that, but what I'm hearing tonight, and it's 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 completely subjective when I hear, and I heard it here tonight, that the levels are low. Okay, and that is not uh, an objective uh, limit. If your limit is, is the lowest in the nation, it might be 15, it might be 10, okay? Uh, you're 25, 30% of the way there. I'm hearing about blending cancer in water with, with water that is less uh, cancer, cancer uh, ridden with, with contaminants. And I'm not for that. I'm not in, I, I don't think that's uh, an, an intelligent, mature, responsible, scientific way to mitigate cancer threat. Not when children are dying. And I, and I think that you um, employ, and I've, I've stated this to you folks, I've stated it in, in Boston, on behalf of this board, that, that we develop the technologies and we invest in, in acquiring as a great company in Eversource. And these were the assurances I heard from Mr. Hunt, that we invest in, I don't know if it's carbon gravity or gravin carbity, uh, that, that those treatments that you don't have now, that we invest in those and that we have lower limits and we make this the cleanest water 
in the nation. And if that's not our goal, um, we're, uh, uh, we're on the wrong hunt. But the, the evidence is there, the science is there. Well number six is shut down, is that correct? Yes, you are oh, correct. Okay, and what, was the, what were the limits that made you shut that down? We had a total PFC level of, I believe, 86 at the time. Okay. Um, and right now we have a PFO, a PFOS concentration combined of 25. Okay. And when you had that level, and people are drinking that, it's over the level, um, you had a, a person from acquiring, back, back this up, Mr. Welch, come to the office, and that was fire on high. That was a significant event. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So you see where we're at on this. Um, I, I have made more statements than questions. I'm looking for that PowerPoint presentation. We're looking for communications that you have because we don't have a chance to go elsewhere for our water. We're looking for uh, a, a copy to the town manager, uh, to the assistant town manager, to the chairman of your communications with the Department of Environmental Services. We're looking for uh, an assertion uh, from you folks on your lobbying money uh, that's up there, and it's, uh, it's quite a bit of money. It's more than the selectmen make. It's more than the town manager makes. It's more than uh, Carl makes. And uh, um, you're buying something with that. And we, we want to buy clean water from you. And we want to make sure that that money isn't be used to fight uh, a legislative agenda that protects people and their children in drinking clean water. Thank you, gentlemen. I don't need a response to that. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there anything else? Do you, do you have any questions, Fred? No, sir. No. And I was at the meeting this afternoon and stuff. I have no questions at this point. Uh, anybody else have any follow-ups? <clears throat> no? Do you have anything follow-up? No, other than I, I truly believe that uh, we are being transparent with our information um, and willing to, to share where we are. And I think that's going to be a productive process moving forward as a, uh, as a group. So we thank you for the time. Yeah, and I was going to say, we, we provided all the data up to date to yeah. Fred and, and others this afternoon, and we provided the maps, so I'm happy to provide the PowerPoint. It's, it's the same information. Very good. So you guys said it in the meeting, and it was very transparent. I thought you, you did a good job. So thank you very much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Have a good evening. Yes. Okay, approval of minutes, September 25th, 2017. Rick, Regina, Ellen Faber, uh, October 2nd, 2017. Rick, Regina, Ellen Faber, October 12th, 2017. Rick, Regina, <laughs> Ellen Faber. <laughs> Town manager's report, please. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, work continues on the replacement of the Lafayette Road sewer line from Winnicott Road to High Street. Work hours are from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Sunday through Thursday. That's in the evenings, uh, and this is this is a, this is a night uh, a night proposition, a night night road work. Uh, please watch the detours, watch the heavy equipment, and watch well for the workers in the roadway. We don't want to have any accidents. Uh, it's too early, not too early to begin arranging for parking your vehicle during the winter parking ban which runs from November 15th to April 15th. Overnight parking is banned on all streets between those dates from 1 a.m. to 7 a.m. During snow emergencies, parking is permitted in certain municipal parking lots. Please check section 805.5 of the town ordinances that are online for the specific details on which lots and under what conditions. It's much too long to be talking about here uh, if you have questions, please call us. We'll be happy to go over those questions with you. We are requesting that the state uh, plow and clear snow from the main beach parking lots and allow residents to park there without paying fees during the period of November 15th to April 15th, overnight parking ban, and during snow emergencies. The State Department of Public uh, Trans the State Department of Transportation is planning to replace a pile of lifting device on the Hampton Harbor Bridge. Information is the bridge will remain open to traffic during the work period, but the lift portion of the bridge will not be operable. Please come watch our meeting next Monday night, October 30th. The selectmen will be meeting and having a presentation from the state DOT on their work to be accomplished. Originally, and I received this today, originally they were planning on replacing the uh, the devices that, that assisted lifting the bridge called couplers in November of 2017 
because of delays in manufacturing and shipping that's been postponed to at least April, to, uh, excuse me, February 2018. Um, I will say, Mr. Chairman, that I had the opportunity to attend with our Public Works Director and Assistant Director a meeting at uh, the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Seacoast Office at the Pease Trade Port, talking about not only the bridge replacement, but also the, uh, the damage that's being done in the harbor because of the shoaling that's going on down, the, the embankments that are being removed by the, the reroute of the uh, water from the Blackwater River and, and uh, water coming in through the, through the harbor and, and exiting again. There's a, a great deal of damage being done down there. It's going to require the construction of seawalls. It's going to require the, the filling behind those seawalls. There's already approximately 100 to 125 feet of shoreline that's missing just on the west side of the, of the bridge, on the south side of the, of the bridge itself. Um, we have a, and we're working with the town of uh, Seabrook to uh, uh, have a, an emergency standby proposition uh, because our sewer line that runs from Sun Valley is now exposed. It runs across the harbor floor and all that material has been washed out. There is a potential for that line to be broken at some time in the future. We hope not. But we are preparing for that eventuality should it occur. One of the things that I learned from the, the dredge management task force meeting in, in, uh, on October 18th over in Portsmouth was that the United States Army Corps of Engineers has absolutely no funds to handle any of the shoaling or the other problems in Hampton Seabrook Harbor. Uh, they have no idea when those funds may become available. There was talk about 2024 as an outside date for when work might, might be available to be done over there depending upon appropriations and engineering work. Uh, the state also has no information on when that may, may take place. 2024 is going to be a little late for us. Uh, we'll have to have something more substantial before that. But we're keeping an eye on it and making sure, that, in fact, the citizens are protected. That's it, sir. Questions? So the bridge work is getting postponed until February. At least February 2018. And I will say that this is the number one red line bridge in the state. Yes. This is, I think, the third or fourth time it's been postponed. Rick. Um, is that because they're waiting to see if there's going to be an infrastructure program federally? That I don't know. We did question them about their plans and what they want to do with the bridge. <clears throat> and what they told us was they haven't even started thinking about it yet. So uh, there are funds supposedly that are going to be available for inf infrastructure improvement. Um, they know that it's going to cost in excess of $35 million to replace the bridge or to do something with it. They have not yet decided whether or not they will leave the bridge the way it is and reconstruct it in place, uh, that is to remove pieces and replace them with new pieces without actually changing the position, the length or the, or the size of the draw, uh, or they, were, they have no idea whether they're going to actually build a new bridge, they're going to replace this one in pieces, uh, they're just simply going to shore it up. They have no idea what they're going to do. There are no plans currently to do anything with the bridge. And um, I know that I have people that I've talked to uh, that live on the harbor and that areas where they've had where they could pull their boat up, all of a sudden you can't pull a, pull a boat up anymore because right. it's all filled with sand. Now, is it possible that that whole harbor could be filled with much more sand than it's ever been filled before, and that uh, that sand is it causing some type of a, uh, of the water to rise higher in the marsh, where that's what could be affecting all of the people that live along the marsh that have never had these issues before. Is it possible that that? extra sand that's sitting in the harbor is taking a place of where all the water really should be instead of coming into people's property. It is part of the displacement problem. Uh, as you probably have seen if you take a close look, uh, everybody knows about middle ground which runs from the Hampton uh, Seabrook town line, runs down through the, the harbor and separates Hampton Harbor from the Blackwater River. Uh, that area has 
five, six, seven years ago. The Corps of Engineers came in and, and sealed off a breach in that. That breach has simply moved further down. And it's at an angle where it's cutting off the area which is on the south side of the bridge on the west side, which is now, that's why we're missing 100 to 125 feet of that entire embankment down there, and the entire shoreline is gone. Uh, yes, the harbor is filling. Uh, and that's going to cause a significant problem. Middle ground is probably no longer going to be a clam bed because it's going to be disappeared by the time they get to actually do the physical work to replenish that area. Uh, it's just going to continue to shoal up. And I did notice the other day that uh, there are, in fact, several boats on the sides because the, the sand is so high in there. But it is a strictly a problem of displacement. It's the same problem we're having up on Meadow Pond, where the pond has filled up. It's call the process of a eutrophication. Eventually it's going to turn the pond into a meadow. In this case, it's going to turn the harbor into an, an, uh, a situation where boating will not be able to get in there. It's just going to be too full of sand. And that will encourage flooding in other areas. Well, I, I think we, we need to really take a look at what type, if we have to do a study or something like that. But more importantly, this is the type of thing that all the years that I have lived in Hampton, whether it was uh, Senator Bob Preston, yep. whether it was Senator Beverly Hollingsworth, or whether it was Senator Nancy Stiles, they led the way every single time. And why are we not hearing from Dan Innes? Can't answer that question. Well, we need to, uh, we need to uh, send him an invitation to come here and talk about this and that. many <laughs> other issues. Yep. And I'm ready to make that uh, motion. I'll so I'll make it right I'd, I'd like to finish the comment, if you can, because I'd ask you to modify it um, in a second when, you, when I'm done. But I, I'm not assuming that you're done with your comments, and I'd like to go back to your motion when you're done and when I'm done. You finished? Yes. Okay. Phil? Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I am uh, uh, very concerned about that. So you're saying that um, the channel down there is filling. It is. And it's in Hamptons. Both Hampton and Seabrook. And territorial waters belonging to who? The waters are under control of the United States Corps of Engineers. Okay. And this is at a, a crisis for, for maritime traffic? It's getting there okay. very quickly. Let me let me talk about first responder, responder stuff first. I, I would like uh, a chop from our fire department on our emergency boat that gets underway out of there uh, at low tide. I want to make sure we're good to go on that. That's number one. So I don't expect that tonight, but I, I want that. Number two is I want an assessment from the Coast Guard if they have to come in there in, in war and, and drop off people if there are uh, uh, conditions where a chopper can't heel or lift someone off a, a, a small boat, that's, uh, what, what those contingencies are, and that we don't suffer any loss of life for that. That's, that's my first point in uh, working with our uh, emergency response director, the chief of police. So that's my first thing. Second thing is when you look at the... Um, uh, and I want to get back to modifying it. The Hampton Beach Master Plan, which goes back to 1999, okay? We're now into uh, year 20 through 50, and I don't support much of what's in this document. Uh, we're going to bring this up. If I'm not here next week, later on, uh, there's an appointment. Uh, the Hampton Harbor and State Marina uh, is specifically listed here. Maintain a six-foot depth of channel in Mooring Field. Uh, it calls for the responsible party to be the PDA, uh, in the New, Har New Hampshire Department of Transportation, and you're saying it, it falls outside of that? A number of years ago, a study was done under, I think it's Chapter 226 of the Federal Navigation Law. Uh, the state asked the Army, Army Corps of Engineers to do that study for the purpose of, prior to that, the, the state had to fund all the dredging. The Army funded nothing. They were paid for doing it. They were successful in showing that the commercial establishments down the harbor, the, the boating establishments, the commercial companies that vote out of there, um, in fact, provide enough income to justify the federal government taking the harbor over and maintaining it. So the, the maintenance of the harbor itself is under the Army Corps of Engineers. I think the, the anchorages and so forth are assigned through the state um, port authority. But okay. The harbor is maintained by the federal government. So I, I see, I see um, number one, our life safety. I see the recreational use. I see it as a tourist issue. I see it as an economic benefit. I see it as a safety hazard. And uh, I, I think it's uh, uh, a 
terrible breach of uh, just uh, uh, standards in Hampton. Uh, the Hampton Beach area master plan, the, uh, the chairman has resigned effective 60 November. It seems that this thing hasn't been updated since its inception. He sent me an email on that and, and to you. So this particular uh, effort, if uh, there's any reason at all for the Hampton Beach Area Commission to exist, it would certainly be to have safe and navigable waters. And I would like to incorporate that the uh, Peace Development Authority, the Army Corps of Engineers, and uh, who's ever running the uh, Hampton Beach Area Commission come in here uh, and brief us on what their efforts have been uh, recently, historically, uh, and going back several years to address this issue. If you'll incorporate that. Um, so you're saying that we should have, I would like to see the PDA, and I would like to see uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, of course, we're not likely to see that. So I'd rather than sit around waiting for them to come, I'd rather see uh, the senator yeah. uh, myself. And I really don't see any reason to have John Nye come in. Thank you. Then I'll, re I'll remove that. Thank you. So you've got your motion. Yes. Second. Second. All in favor? Got Dan is in us. And uh, what meeting? You want to as, as soon as, as, as possible. They can come within, with you know, uh, be. In the next two weeks, maybe okay. three weeks. Okay. Right. Okay. You got you'll, it. You'll get in touch. Yes, with sir. Them? I will. Okay. And I have a question. Wasn't there just a problem with the bridge just recently? There was. Again, the state DOT made temporary repairs. They were describing what they found when they went underneath there, that the bridge had been chewing up the gears, and they found basically a large pail full of just shredded <coughs> gear gear drives. So they did some temporary repairs to it themselves in order to get it to function. Certainly the lift device has to be very ginger, gingerly handled, otherwise it will fail, and they've said that. So they're managing to operate it, and they said they will keep it in operation until such time as they can replace the couplers which lift the bridge. And, and wasn't there an email from companies or something down there that were having Al problems? Barnes. Yes. Yep. Having problems? Yes. With make, having to make uh, uh, refunds and give out passes and stuff That's because correct. the bridge wasn't operable. So, it, I mean, it's not only just the traffic, it, it's the businesses down there, and they're small businesses, right. they're not large businesses, so they're not people that can afford to have to be out of business. Their business is boats, them. and boats can yeah. kind of get through. Right. right. So, I mean, it, it is it is a, a problem, and it does need to be addressed. It's, anything we can do to help that would be a... a Really good. I we think did, that, you know, like the, this particular issue about the sand, I've never heard it discussed at the Hampton Beach Area Commission, where I've been a member there for, I believe, nine years. I'm not saying that they should, and if they are supposed to do it, then we need to uh, make this clear that that's what we expect because there's been a lot of uh, stuff in the paper that this board's been giving direction. Yeah. And to be truthful, I haven't seen our board give any direction to the chairman of the Hampton Beach Area Commission, except for what's common knowledge. Okay. I don't, I've don't. i never seen any of the other boards I've been on sit down and give direction. But we're told that um, it's, uh, they can't t t you know deal with the direction that the town's giving, then maybe the next time we should give direction. Yes, sir. Old business. I guess under old business, we we talk about uh, just briefly the letter that we're writing to HB on HB 324. Sure. All right. The letter that has been written. It's being sent to the to the uh, to the governor to the uh, Chuck Morse to Jeb Bradley to everybody up at the state house that's involved. And it deals with HB 324, and it was put together by Ed Tinker. Ed, do you want to just briefly or give us the uh, what's in this letter, and who we who we're sending it to, and what we're asking for? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, this is a bill carried over from last year. What it what it'll do is it'll um, yep. let the state, the DRA, be the only uh, entity appraising utility properties town will have to use it have no choice right now about a third of the communities in the state use dra values we have in the past however they're predicated on the unit method of valuation which has historically been a, a, a low valuation 
um, looking at utility and the infrastructure of utility. Um, it looks at uh, the utility as a whole throughout the whole state and then allocates um, percentages to every community, not necessarily what you have in the state in your, in your town, or at least it's the historical cost, less depreciation of what's located within the community. So the value begins, you know, artificially low, and then the allocation doesn't help the situation. That even drives it further down below fair market value. Uh, we're required to use fair market value in all of our assessments, uh, residential, commercial, or utility. This would take that away and develop the unit method, which right now is not an acceptable method by the state or by the legislature, um, not one of the five uh, methodologies that are that are allowed. Uh, the letter has to do with, with just that, uh, requesting that um, the legislator not uh, pass the bill, um, allow communities that don't use DRA values to uh, use utility appraisers to determine fair market value. Uh, just for Hampton's sake, um, our uh, value currently for the four utilities done in 2016 by our utility appraiser uh, had a net uh, assessed value of $100 million. Looking at the state's value this year um, of those same utilities for Hampton, it would be uh, just under $80 million. So it's about a $21 million reduction. Or based on today's tax rate or the 16 tax rate, about a $300,000 loss in revenue. Uh, if this uh, bill passes and we're, we need to use their uh, uh, unit method or their, unit, you know, their value determined unit method. And currently... This bill is being opposed by the New Hampshire Municipal Association. Yes. Right? Yeah. Also, uh, is there an assessors association that's that's the come out New, against yeah, this? Yes, the New Hampshire Association of Assessing Officials. And that include all assessors in New Hampshire. Yes. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Right. Uh, as an organization, there's. Uh, and pretty much, are, is every town fighting this? Uh, town, even yes, especially the smaller towns. The smaller towns are. Um, the, the, the ratio of utility value to total value can get up to the 50-50 range. Uh, so it's a really, uh, could be a financial uh, hit on smaller communities, potentially raising their tax rates by 15, 20 percent, two, three, four, five dollars per thousand. Um, they, the, you know, the, the, the talk is that, that these high assessments are causing uh, utility bills didn't rise. I, I, again, I don't really know the full thing of it, but there was a study done that the uh, property tax was uh, less than one half of one percent of the rate, utility rate, that's uh, generated in New Hampshire you know, for those utilities. So I don't think it's, and it's one of the lowest uh, actually uh, tax rates in the, in the country, so I don't, I don't think that's uh, for the public, I don't think they're going to see an offset that would make up for the loss in revenue and the rise in the tax rate based on a reduction in, uh, uh, in utility rates. But it's going to take away three hundred thousand dollars of annual revenue. Yeah. Estimated based on uh, right. Yep. Yeah, this year. Yeah. Yeah. Phil. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and. Uh, we talked, or I talked, or somebody talked, I think it was me, about Bo. Well, yes. And, and expound on that, please, and what they're looking at for a hit. Uh, well, uh, Bo's been, uh, the uh, Eversource has appealed uh, back starting in 2000, I believe, 12, 11 or 12, yeah. for the Bo power plant. Um, uh, Superior Court sided with Eversource. Uh, the Bo plant uh, represents about 13% of their total tax burden for the revenue um, so the effect of that um, and I do I did uh, send copies of that information but it was very uh, millions of dollars in refunds that are potentially due Bo, I mean ever source if uh, the the, um, the case has now been appealed to the Supreme Court Supreme Court's going to hear it Supreme Court's uh, also heard last year the uh, ever source uh, New Hampshire Electric Co-op appeals, or PSNH, I should say, yeah, 
um, where the uh, uh, BTLA sided with, uh, uh, with the towns that, that fair market value, uh, not the unit method is the, is the correct method to use at this point. Uh, so Bo, Bo uh, potentially could see not only a large refund due, but a, a hit to their tax rate um, in the uh, two to three dollar per thousand. They're currently 29 something. They're almost thirty dollars per thousand. So, so, but other communities are even greater. They have forty. Let's say forty percent of their tax, their tax rate or their their revenue is from the utilities that where they could see a, 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 a great hit. There was a report that I also sent the board. It was a 20-page report done uh, by the assessors and some other individuals indicating the same objections to passing the bill that had a list of every community in the state and the effect that, or the estimated effect, um, if the bill passed, what that would have an effect on as a tax rate was. Thank you, Mr. Tinker. So this is uh, a bill that is before science, technology, and energy. And they've got committee members. And that's being exec when? Um, they're currently, there's a study committee uh, for that. Uh, they're doing a study committee. They, they report back, I believe, in November to the okay. full committee. Check online, and I'm a little bit slow with my computer, but I think there's going to be something on 25 October at 1400 in they, the Yellow Bay. They may be reporting what they're finding. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the, and and the I, I think it's important that we have a presence there. I may very well not be in the state, and I cannot attend. But um, the chairman rightfully talked about a campaign, uh, and I think it's important to have a presence, and I think it's important for you with other assessors to be there. I think it's important for you to have a continual uh, and, and concurrent and uh, persistent relationship with uh, Cordell and Judy at the New Hampshire Municipal Association and see what they're doing to drive this. Uh, the chairman and I have worked on this uh, before with uh, the pollution control. You saw this evening the kind of money that is being spent by Eversource that now controls our water. And they're behind this, correct? Is that a yes or a no? They're behind Eversource? This? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're looking for this, this reduction in payments uh, and on an annual basis, and not all of Eversource, but maybe more, is a quarter million dollars of, of folks up there wearing orange tags and talking to legislators, and, and there's two, two, uh, two former members of, in the legislature that sit on this board, one's not here tonight, and they know what we're talking about. So um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of payments are being made for people to wage a war against people uh, that are citizen legislators that make $200 a year, and, and we're, we're enjoying the fight. Uh, but uh, you go from uh, pollution in your water uh, and people not uh, lowering limits and, and, and not being objective about limits to going to people attacking your tax base. And I'm not saying Eversource is, is, is uh, um, malignant in this uh, or malicious or malevolent, but I'm saying but there is a pattern. And uh, that's why we ask when it comes to water uh, that we be appraised of their efforts. And are they dedicating uh, uh, utility money and ratepayer money to uh, maintain high standards of uh, carcinogens in the water when other states have much lower? And then sit there and talk subjectively that it's a safe limit. And back to the uh, uh, assessment, $324,000. And that fight has got to be aggressive. And I would, uh, um, uh, I, I know this letter has gone out, Mr. Chairman, to the governor. Yes. To Mr. It has gone? No, it's mailed tomorrow. Mailed tomorrow. I would, I would actually include um, uh, the entire committee for uh, science, technology, and energy, and to the chairman, Mr. Barry. And then there's sponsors, and the sponsors and the people that are making up this bill. Uh, and, and I'm going to call them out. All right. Uh, Patrick Abrami, who is a Republican. Gary Azarian, who's a Republican. Patrick Lovejoy. Uh, Patricia Lovejoy, a Democrat, Douglas Thomas, a Republican, Michael Vose, a Republican, Regina Birdsell, a Republican, Lou D'Alessandro, you talk about senators, Lou D'Alessandro, a Democrat, Sharon Carson, a Republican, and some of these people carry some weight up there, and they've been around there a long time, and I know every source is talking to these people, and it's not transparent, and it's a broken system. When we have people down here that are paying their taxes, suddenly this, this, this bill alone is going to be $324,000 uh, 
uh, Bo is Bo has stood up and they've they've engaged in a tort issue, correct? Correct. Yeah. And and and, 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 and then get back to it is you know the Supreme Court justices were in the parking lot this week. There's a, a, a newspaper article saying that uh, the selectmen's defending our tort action, and, and right next to it, I saw Max today. It's 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 a it's a if it weren't so serious, it'd be a funny juxtaposition, and that's your only relief on this stuff is to get it in front of a judge because the money and the influence and the, the game is stacked against us. And if you're not taking this to court, um, it's a loser's game well, and the taxpayers. Yeah, this year there's 95 uh, appeals pending before the BTLA from Eversource themselves. So exactly. 9, 95 new, new appeals. And if, 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 if this wins and uh, uh, in spite of the unconstitutionality that's already been deemed, then um, this is a harbinger of, of local government is going to go away. And we don't need Mr. Chenker. And we can lay it. Well, just hear me out. This is. Do you hear me? There's. We can. We can. We can privatize your outfit. And these people right here: Abrami, Azarian, Lovejoy, Thomas, Voz, Birdsell, D'Alessandro, and Carson. They want the state to do your job. And they want to take your job because you know house appraisals, realtors do that. Jim did that as a profession. Um, you know there are other other sources. These are the hard ones. And if you think that money or, or property. Up in the North Country, as beautiful as it is, is as valuable as property in the Sea Coast. Uh, you're not much of uh, a scholar. You're not much of a business person, and you don't understand basic economics. The stuff that's going on down here is much more valuable up there. I, I have talked to Chairman Barry about this, and he's, he's he's he says his town Wolf Bar was going to lose money as well, but he's for it. And the notion that because real estate has to be equalized with one class of businesses, well, how about insurance businesses or hairdressing businesses? Let's have them. Let's have the state do those businesses as well. How about restaurants? You know, what's what's what is us the limit when we open this Pandora's box with the state over, overtaking local control? And that's what this is. And this is 0.3 million dollars on this one bill alone. 0.3 million dollars. So I would uh, uh, make the motion, uh, Mr. Chairman, and your excellent campaign on this, and thank you for your esteemed leadership on it, that this letter additionally go to each and every uh, science and technology and energy member, uh, and to each uh, sponsor, and it's on the uh, House of Representatives website, and that furthermore, we have uh, in the uh, middle of November, we have the uh, entire delegation, including Senator Ennis, come in here and sit before the board and explain to this board what exactly they're doing with other towns and other legislators, and have they taken any money from some of these uh, lobbyists, and what are they doing to help us uh, secure local control and preserve our tax base, and that is a motion. I'll second it. Motions on the, on the, the letter, first of all. Right. I'll second the whole Yeah, time. your letter, your letter uh, to send to, to the list that you have on it, Mr. Chairman, and, and it's a great letter, and thank you, and to the uh, entire committee, committee. and right. to and the to the sponsors. sponsors, and to have the entire delegation come in here and right. brief the board. Okay. Second. All in favor? All right. Passes unanimously. So you can take care of that letter. Yeah, and I'll, I'll come in and sign it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, that's it under old business, unless somebody else has something. Uh, thank you. Uh, good. New business. Purchasing policy and purchasing procedures waiver section 718-16, sole source supplier ISG um, slash Scott X380 thermal imaging camera. I might say that's a mouthful, Mr. It Chairman. Is. Uh, and very difficult to say. I'm glad you said it and not me. All right. <clears throat> the fire department had sent a communication to me uh, recently. It was the 19th. They have a thermal imaging camera, which is purchased from Scott. Uh, it's almost 20 years old, and it's barely usable at this point, and it has absolutely no value. Uh, they called Scott. They told them they were in need of a replacement. Um, Scott has indicated that they will be happy to provide a replacement, uh, and they're willing to give us a $1,000 credit for the 20-year-old camera, which is pretty generous. The cost uh, after the credit is uh, $7,238. I would recommend that the selectmen grant the waiver that we purchase, it's, and Scott is a sole source supplier, uh, that we in fact purchase the uh, the camera and the imaging camera 
and uh, replace the one that we have, which is barely usable at all at this point. Discussion? And I'll make the motion. I'll second it. Discussion? All in favor? Passed. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay. You. Oops. Do you have something else? No. Nope. Okay. Tax rate setting. Do you want to do the budgets for the people who are waiting first, and then we'll do tax rate since I have to stay, or do you want to do tax rate first? What do you think? I think we'll, cemetery let's do the back budgets there first. and mosquito okay. control maybe. I don't yeah, know. we'll do the budget first. Mr. Chairman, uh, cemetery had called today. There's a, a personal issue, and if we can take cemetery first, please. Okay. Good evening. This is evening. kind of an anomaly for me tonight. I've been coming here for 150 years, and I think this is the first time I've come uh, with actually people I've never met before. So, Ms. Barnes and uh, Chairman Waddle, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm yeah. Danny Kenny, Cemetery Director, and this is Sue Irwin, uh, Chairman of the Board of Trustees. That's me. Okay. Um, our budget this year, I pretty much did it the same way I've always done it. Uh, I looked at uh, the end of June, where we were and what we had, uh, projected it out over 12 months, and then tried to make the adjustments uh, where they seem to need to be made. Um, you probably will notice that uh, line, where are we? On the seven, seven, it's not here, but on the cemetery improvement lines, which we've carried $1 year after year, we're moving up that to $5,000 this year. We hope this to be an annual housekeeping type thing. We, we, we have a 160-year-old cemetery there, and we have an infrastructure that hasn't been tended to, and I don't know when. Um, I'm talking about trees, I'm talking about roads, I'm talking about uh, irrigation, I'm talking about restoration, we, we're talking about possibly moving the gate. Um, we know we won't get all that done this year, we probably won't get it done in five years, ten years, but to uh, quote President Kennedy in, in his inauguration, uh, let us begin. And other than that, Susan? Nope, I Okay. I guess that's all I have for you. Questions? Questions right now? No. Um, I don't have that many questions, but I will tell you I've had several people that have commented lately on uh, the possibility of changing something to do with fencing that's around yes. there. Yes. Uh, the fact that it's a yep. chain link fence, yep. and I've suggested maybe they do a warrant article or something like that. I'm not really sure which is the best way to go. But yeah, let us begin to make it look more. That, that is one. That is one of the things on the table for us, Rick. That that fence uh, back sometime in the '60s. I'm not sure when. The state made a law that all cemeteries have a circumference around them, and they put up that stucco wall to start with. And I guess that didn't work out too well. So that's what led to the fence. That no longer is a law. And uh, Susan has really been on this, right? So this may be one of the things we will be addressing. I think beautifying it, it doesn't, certainly it doesn't need a chain link fence. And uh, I'm not sure if this law does, isn't there anymore. Maybe it doesn't even have a fence. Yeah. Uh, no, it, they're I no don't. longer required by law. Yeah, and you know, p people do, it's amazing how many times I've heard about people that do go there for a lot of different reasons. It's sometimes to visit people, sometimes just to have a contemplative uh, walk. Uh, it should be more inviting, yes. and a chain link fence makes it uninviting. Well, we certainly don't want that. So, but you don't want to too soon. The whole idea of a cemetery. <laughs> well, the whole idea of a cemetery is for a place for people to go for peace. You know, and that, yeah, you know. so they're, they're. So I hope they're finding peace inside. Uh, I hope they're telling you that. Yeah, I know in the past we've worked on things where, like, the pe person that wanted a dog spa next to it where there could be. 130 bar barking dogs. I mean, we've prevented those things. Yes. So now it's time to be proactive and do something to beautify. So I totally agree with that. Thank you, Rick. 
Phil. And so under cemetery improvements, to speak to uh, Selectman Griffins, um, you're requesting 5,000. What, what is that going to? We don't know yet, Phil. We're, we're going to meet all, all the things I mentioned. I don't, I don't know where we're going to start. I probably, Susan would probably say, well, well I'm big on getting that fence gone. <laughs> Pardon me? I'm big on getting that fence gone because it looks like a prison yard. Yeah. But we've talked about taking down trees. We have to do something about some of the roadways. So if we can get the 5000 then we'll decide which one of our projects. And, and, and are you talking about the front on High Street for starters for the fence? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Could we, could we um, if the board allows, and I think Rick makes a, a great uh, point, uh, could you get an estimate on that? And I know there's local fence, there's two or three of them. Mm -hmm. Get get some yeah, bids and, to do that. and come back here. If you don't already have them, uh, uh, in a week, week and a half, um, and add that to your budget. Look at that 5,000. It's a pretty simple thing. It's a straight shot of fence. Right. Um, and uh, come back here for you. But if the board wants to, I think it's completely doable. Taking it down, we can probably get it done for nothing. Yeah, and I know Mr. Welch has been a big supporter of taking care of our people that have departed. Oh, yeah, that's a very important thing. We can get the county has offered to use uh, the prisoners, the exemplary prisoners, <laughs> from the, the county uh, facility to come over and do work for us, provided we provide them with pizza for lunch and we provide them with equipment to do the work. That's and all well, good and Fred, but I've been hearing that for 20 years and it never seems to happen. Nobody has asked me. Well, I've asked okay. on many times. I've and, they, and, they, and they've always told me the same thing. They said, yeah, sure, we'll get in touch with you. And I never hear from them. Yeah, well. So I've been around a little bit longer than you. The sheriff asked us to do that. Well, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to take them on. I'd be more than happy to buy them pizza. So that's fine. Okay, I, I have a few questions myself. Just on the regular wages going up 2.41. That is? Yes. Yeah. That's contractual or that's? Anybody giving me an answer? Well, this is what we agreed to. This is what I submitted to the uh, trustees, and this is what they approved. It's not contractual. We're not, not contractual. We don't have contracts okay. with them. Okay. No, okay. Not. I'm just asking. Uh, Part-time wages going up 3.19. Yeah. And that's not contractual. But, but what what reason? I just that most most of the time somebody comes in and they go through their budget and they go line by line. They give us the reason why they've done something. Well, I can do that if you like. I, I would, please. Okay. All right, uh, regular wages, that's me, uh, you know, an increase to 44.7. Part-time wages, I again, I looked where I was in June. Uh, none of my guys have had a raise for some time now, so I do wish to give them a raise this year. So that, that, that plays into that. Health insurance, we just have that at $500 only to keep it open. I have my health insurance through another venue. Medicare, uh, retirement, uh, con uh, contracted services, that includes, that, that means people I hire to do certain work, like the plumber comes in today to shut the water off, or if we hire someone to do the fence, that would all come out of contracted services. Telephone, electric. Right, hang on one second, contracted services. The budget line was $3,000 and you've spent 700 Mm -hmm. And you're asking for a 66 percent increase. Well, we're going to be spending more. The, 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 most of that gets spent in the in the fall. Okay, so that's that's when we have the water turned off and I have have other things of that nature done. Um, telephone, like ele uh, electric, we're hoping. I've we've been running low on that i've increased telephone the, f87 percent what's what's that it's 800 this year it's 599 it's going to 15. right well once it, well it, it it was when i looked at it in june i i went from there i, I saw where i was in june and it looked like it was going to be more than 800 to me so i put in 1500. Heat and fuel, that's 
the, the heat for the cemetery. Obviously, we haven't had that on since uh, February or March, but we will be turning it on soon. Water is uh, the most unpredictable line. I kind of wanted to come up and talk to the Aquarian guys when they were here. I, I just never know where water's going to go. We, like, we shut off the water. I remember several years ago, we shut off the water, well, this time of year, November. And I remember December 7th of uh, one year, I also I got a $2,700 bill from Aquarian. No idea. How could that be? I went to see him. And they said, no, $1,000 is wrong, it's $1,700. But it still put me over budget that year, and I still, uh, well, they're still, they're still uh, nailing them to Roland Page, not be, you know, Roland Page only passed in 1990, but that's okay. Uh, repairs and maintenance, those are, those are repairs to our machines, uh, all, all our equipment. Uh, supplies and expenses, the, 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 those are things like um, stationary stamps, uh, chairs, we're, you know, we're doing a uh, refurbish of uh, the office, cosmetic refurbish. Uh, gasoline is gasoline, you can never be quite sure about that. I've already explained about cemetery improvements. As far as replacement equipment, we are this year hoping to get those two new mowers that we're going to get last year. The only reason we didn't, uh, we had a piece of equipment, uh, actually a leaf and a um, pine needle sucker that was $4,000 and all my guys wanted that. Instead of having to shovel things in the truck, now they can just hold down and suck them all up. Um, so, but we did have to baby those two mowers, and but we got them through the season, and uh, they will they will be replaced this year or next year, I should Thank say. You. I just speaking for myself, I, I I can't. I would not vote for the budget simply because I need more. Like when you say contracted services, well, I don't know what they're going to be, and you say cemetery improvement, I don't have a plan yet. I would like to see a plan. I'd like to see where the money's going. I'm going to make a motion <clears throat> that we be uh, come back in two weeks with a uh, a uh, price for the fence to uh, be replaced. Uh, it'll be around two thousand. It'll, it'll be around two thousand dollars, right? Yeah. Well, we need we need someone to we need to see the uh, you know a uh, estimate an estimate, and uh, I would say with and without the the price if they take the fence down and the price if they don't take the fence down in case we're able to do it uh through the sheriff's yeah. department yeah. so i'd like to make that motion well i would like to add to that yeah. that contracted services what what, what contracted services what, what are we talking about you know when, when somebody it's comes anyone in, we have to hire to come in like but, I, but, I just had the building no, i know that but what i'm saying is when dpw comes in or something they say contracted services they say we got to hire people for snow plowing we got a very specific and i, I just my I, own feeling i can't approve something that's just general just I think well, we'll you do. may see it, you may call it general, Mr. Waddell, but I'll tell you something. Of the twenty-five largest cemeteries in the state, we're the only ones operating under two hundred thousand dollars a year. So we must be doing something right, sir. You you must be, but I'm just asking for a more specific. Budget. It's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. I don't know. You Come know, back from what you've done last year. Come in with with what contracted services you had to use this year. Just well, we had to get roads fixed. We had to get tree, trees. Uh, all the trees we take down. That comes to the I don't know. I don't know how many trees are going to fall next year. I can't sit here and tell you. Well, we're going to have five if pine I, trees I, fall I may, next Mr. year. Mr. Chairman, if I may, yeah. may um, Mr. Kenny, is is the chairman rightfully is asking for information and he's requesting it and okay, you're going well. to provide it. And it doesn't have to be down to the penny, but you can you can do that. You can there was a tr the tree snow removing, uh, you know, all that stuff, yeah. yeah. And, and and have that listed so he knows. And he rightfully asked for that. And uh, is there a second on the motion? We'd like it down to the penny about the um, fence, though. All right, I'll second that whole motion. All in favor? That I can do. Yeah. Uh, but again, I can't tell you how many trees are going to fall next year. <laughs> I can't, you know, that one one pine tree is four thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, so. That when you talk about contracted services, there's just no possible way to 
And it would be good to have the two prices, the one with them taking down the fence and without it, so that we can see just what type of a bargain we're getting from the um, sheriff. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Thank you. Jill. Mosquito control. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tim O'Connor. For those of you who don't know me, uh, the mosquito uh, committee budget essentially pays for a contract with Dragon Mosquito, and it's uh, right now we're in, we're just finished the second year of a three-year contract. We've got another year going uh, on that contract. It's fixed priced. So going forward, we're just looking for a, a 2018 budget that reflects the uh, the 2017 budget. I have no questions. I think you do a great job, so I just want to thank you. And I see the guys out there all the time from Dragon and Mosquitoes. They seem to do a very good job. They're a very, very good contractor. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so moved. Okay, I just have a question. The um, mosquito diseases, mm -hmm. were there were there any in New Hampshire last year? In, in Rye, they, uh, well, there were no, no diseases. We, they, uh, Dragon does uh, Hampton, Rye, and Seabrook. In Rye, uh, they had trapped some mosquitoes that proved positive for uh, West Nile. Right. Okay. But there, there were no, uh, no cases. No, no human no cases. cases. And the reason for that is because of the mosquito control, right? That we, we, we because of the treatments we treat it, treatments we do and plus it's uh we do it for that and just for the comfort of people at in a resort in the resort yeah. towns yeah you guys do a great job uh, all we have a motion wait a second second okay all in favor super okay. thank, thank you very much our executive Mr. Chairman, the executive includes the Board of Selectmen, the Town Manager's Office, the Budget Committee, the Trustee of Trust Funds. If we take them all together, there is a 0.87% decrease in these budgets. Super. Question. We try. <clears throat> Questions? Make the motion to approve the executive Second. budget. Second. Any discussion? I just want to say okay. that. Um, when I started here 10 years ago, the Board of Selectmen had, had a bigger stipend than they have now. It was removed uh, so that we would so, show solidarity with the employees having their raises, which they've had multiple times since then. And I would like just some information at some point. How, what are the, what are, I, I know in Seabrook it's uh, more than double what it is here. I'd like to know what it is in Exeter. Sure. And uh, we can do a survey. Yes, I'd Not like a problem, to see sir. what it is. Yeah, we can, we can certainly provide that information to you. Because uh, I know that we have more meetings than any of those towns. Yes, you do. I know you do. Completely. <laughs> You're there. <laughs> so we had a motion? Motion, second. Motion and second, yes, sir. Okay. Favor? Okay, super. I would just say in Seabrook they were paying for health insurance, and I know Mr. Griffin's not interested in that. Is it? And it's still sixty-five hundred dollars. Besides, <laughs> they, don't, they don't have that anymore, do they? Yes, yeah, some. No, well, some know. of them did. They gave it up. <laughs> yeah, they were kind of forced to a town meeting. Yeah. All but right, we're going to finance. Sixty-five hundred. Finance. Let's see. You should know right where that is, right? The finance department, let's see, we, the total budget there is actually down. Um, I think you'll find the biggest change. Last year we knew, I was aware of um, some FMLA leave that we were going to have, so I had increased my part-time wages and my overtime wage lines to cover the office in those situations, and those are, have been removed um, from those lines. Let's see what is up here. And everything else, let's see. The next biggest thing is I actually lowered the bank service charges. Some of you may remember, I think it was actually my first year as a finance director that 
in the past the interest had the interest received on the bank accounts had exceeded the charges and so that it had never been budgeted before and then it was put into the budget because that wasn't the case we've been managing or the treasurer has been managing the money in such a way that those fees are dropping so i felt comfortable based on where we were at so far this year that it would be okay to drop that number and hope that in the future we can continue to drop that each year it went from thirty-seven thousand to thirty thousand. so um, that, that's pretty big yes it's a good deal yep yeah. and the interest is actually going up so things are changing around there for the um banking and so i'm down 2.28 percent question for the finance motion so moved second all in favor good job thank you for all you do you're welcome all right and then next are we just going in order here yes yeah, please all right so we're personnel Push administration up. no don't forget the audit oh i'm sorry audit is under finance also and that's a three-year contract um so it does go up slightly next year i believe sorry it goes up 0.47 percent but that's a like i said that i think next year is the third year of the contract so the audit's in there too Okay, do we have to make it separate, separate on the audit? Line, different line. Okay. It's a separate line. Motion yeah. to approve audit. Second. Favor. Good job. Okay, and then under personnel administration, well, most of the costs here are fixed, but let's we can run through them real quick. Um, the employee separation cost, we left it at the same that it has been at, and. I will point out with that line and also with the sick leave buyback program, if there is any funds left in either of those two lines, they are not just um, sent back to the unassigned fund balance. The board can vote at that time to put them into the compensated um, absence trust fund that we have. Uh, so that's if those are o over budget or under budget or whatever, we can use the money in that fashion. Um, the buyback line I did increase. You can see that in 2016, the individuals who uh, did the sick leave buyback, um, that line was maxed out. And then in 17 this year, we actually were at 204,411. So I increased that to 200,000 so that hopefully we'll have um, the funds there to cover the buyback. We don't know those numbers until January, so it's hard right now. Everyone has to turn their election forms in to finance by the beginning of October, but then once we find out the health insurance rates and all that, the buyback program, Mr. Waddell will probably ask me that if I can predict, right, to explain to the public what that is. That is in, um, for the union, it's in all of their contracts in the uh, collective bargaining agreements for their sick time and it's all over the place in regards to most of them it's 400 hours anything over the 400 hours that they have they can sell back to the town um, it can be used to go into their uh, 457 plans it can pay for health insurance dental insurance life insurance any of their portions of the insurances that they're responsible for it can go towards that and it can also be used uh, to be converted to vacation time. No one really does that. There's no dollar value attached to that, but it is an option. It's also in the non-union um, in, in the personnel policy, the same thing, that they can sell back leave time um, over a certain number of hours. I believe it's 240 for the individuals who work 40 hours and anything over 210 for the for the um, non-union who work 35 hours. So that's kind of what the buyback program does there. Let's see, the merit pay line is down. We put in 2% and that would be up to the board's discretion on how that's used for non-union employees. And then Social Security, Medicare, all the remainder of the lines there are literally driven by any of the wage lines in the budget. So they have kind of gone up. Most of them have gone up. Uh, the largest one that went up was the police and it went up 11.75. And I think that when the police was here, the biggest increase in their budget was wage related, which in turn was related to collective bargaining agreements that had passed by the voters um, in previous years. So those are all, everything else in this section is literally driven by wages throughout the remainder of the budget, except for, for the cemetery and library. Two questions. Rick, Phil. Yeah, I do. And, and, and real quickly, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm looking at your uh, uh, New Hampshire retirement system, police and firemen. 
uh, that's uh, one point almost nine million dollars combined. And we talk about our issues with the state, Mr. Chairman. Just real quick, if you're taking ten percent of our calls on state property, right there is one hundred eighty thousand bucks word out the door, and that's just ten percent. And I know in the summer I've seen data that it's twenty percent. So I'm confident we're around ten. Just right there is a bucket, almost two hundred grand of juice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that. Uh that's out of our control, right? How much? Set by the state. Yes. Set by the state. Set by the state. And the last year, they had 13% re return on their investment? Correct. A so. little above that, but yes. Yeah. 13% they had. And, and, and you raise a good point on this, Mr. Chairman, because I, I think they're overcharging us. If you look at 20 years, and we've done those math before, I, I, I think they're they're taking more than they should, but that's just another, another day's discussion. Now, you said on the uh, merit raises you have... 25,292, am I reading that correctly? You are. And that would be? It's literally just taking all of the non-union positions, with the exception of the town manager and the assistant town manager, and adding 2% to what they were being paid as of August, whatever, when I did this budget, which would have already incorporated the 1.65 oh, as a board okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, and uh, I would, when you're ready, I would not vote on eight these sections until we're ready to vote on the whole budget just okay because it will change if you decide to change any of the wage lines and I know that was something that you were going to revisit as a board all right so I would recommend that we do not vote on anything here thank you very much so uh, municipal insurance municipal insurance is not the same as what you have in front of you and unfortunately I apologize I did not reprint this uh, the rates came in on late Thursday or Friday I think I think it might have been late Thursday so the health insurance number has changed. I updated my copy and I, like I said, I apologize, I forgot to print a copy for you guys, but it's good news. Um, the health insurance rates across the board went down 10.5%. Uh, so in front of you, you have a line item for health insurance of 2,974,696. And I'm recommending that we drop that to two million six hundred and thirty two thousand eight hundred and fifty seven dollars um, and then all the other lines in this section are the same as what you have in front of you so I can run through that the liability and the workers comp are both up that's with our carrier uh, Primex carrier which we already have the rates in and the NHMA dues are up slightly also they're up from seventeen thousand twenty seven dollars to seventeen thousand nine hundred and four so the grand total there is three million five hundred and thirty four thousand and sixty two dollars so it's down considerably from what was in that um, copy that you guys have in front of you but once again that's a section that I wouldn't vote on until we go you go through all your position things because there were some um, positions or at least one position that I can think of off the top of my head that's driving that health insurance number and if the full-time position isn't brought forward then that number will drop further okay. so any comments or anything on that yeah just a real one quick one too it's expensive to have people and when you look at that health insurance premium for these guys that are on the beach there's another couple hundred grand thank you mr. chairman uh, debt debt okay Sorry. Um, let me see where debt is all the way in the back Our debt is actually down. Oh, let's see. Overall debt is up 2.69. Uh, the principal payments are up 5.92, and the interest is down 5.08. Um, I did on the interest on TANS, I dropped that um, to 5000 I don't think it's safe to drop it to $0 because we may need to borrow um, in the tax anticipation note or in anticipate. Uh, Good. Anticipation of taxes. Say um, I'm learning slowly, uh, so I dropped that to five thousand because, as you can see, nothing was spent in sixteen, and we haven't spent anything so far in seventeen. So I felt comfortable dropping that. The principal and interest—they are what they are. Um, the voters have all voted on all of the bonds that are in here. We're all voted on, and the principal payments just are up a little, and that could be because of the Lafayette Road sewer project is the driving factor there but uh, on the other hand all of our interests are dropping because a, a lot of the loans um, or a lot of the bonds are nearing the end of their term so the interest drops as they get closer to being expired so 
So it kind of is what it is, I guess. Any reason not to vote on that, or? Um, the only reason you, if you, we want to hold off, I'm still waiting to hear back. I don't know. Last I knew, the bond bank was considering having the January sale. Fred and I have spoken, though. We, we both believe that we probably can remove, I think Fred and I agreed on this, the, the principal and interest for the Lafayette Road sewer project could be removed because I don't believe that we will end up having a bond payment on that. Okay, so um, like but if we end up on. with a ban, we might have some kind of a payment, you know, but right. probably not so the same. So you want us to wait on that? Yeah. Good idea. All right, good. Default? Um, the default budget, let's see. So if anything happens with the debt, yeah. the default. I was going to say everything's going to change, so it's kind of one of those. Yeah, the insurance went down. The insurance affected that when the insurance went yeah, down. Yeah, and so. I did put the new insurance rates in there, so I can get you guys like a new summary sheet. Okay, stuff, so. so let's go back to the top then. Back to the tax top. rate. Do you want to finish the other items that were pending in the budget? Jamie's here. We. Oh uh, yeah, we yeah. Let me pass out to the board, and Jamie can. So what I'm going to pass out to you guys is this, uh, any of the new um, or the proposed positions or changes. There was a couple in the town clerk's office and some in legal. They're all outlined on here. And then also it was asked for us to, for Jamie and I, to look at all of the um, increases for some of the seasonal laborers from the 11 to the $14. So there's a synopsis on a bag in there. Plus the elected officials and other board positions that are under the other boards, like the planning board and stuff, so. Would you like to approach these, Mr. Chairman? I'm trying to think. I, so, I, I would recommend town clerk right off the bat because it's the first page and it's pretty simple. Sure. Is that how you have this? Yep, that's fine. Town clerk was uh, going to be happy to answer any questions. My understanding is the board had some questions with respect to uh, clarifying what they're what they're looking to do there. So my understanding is the town clerk has proposed adding a full time person, 100 percent full time. So in that town clerk proposed position changes 2018, you see what the total cost is for a year at that 59,549.12. It's also broken down if it were to pass in this year to be uh, for the 39 weeks. And also in doing that, there's a recommendation by the, by the town clerk to uh, increase or change a position, um, and that's there for the senior bookkeeper at 39 weeks for that year. I'd be happy to answer any questions. With respect to adding that position, I believe that's you know a justification that town clerk should make to you to you folks. Um, for anecdotally, we see the lines increasing, but I think uh, she should come in and, and defend the position of why it's important to increase it. I wanted to answer your questions with regard to the finance impact. I'd be happy to answer any of those. And she did that night. Yeah, she, she did. She did yeah. come in. Yeah. yeah. And explain express why she want, needed the position and wanted right. the change. Questions, Regina? Um, no, I mean, I'm just looking at this right now, but thank you. I, I would say this, but, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may, I know jumping sure. out here. Uh, they're doing, th it's a, it's a multi-million dollar business, three point something million dollars in revenues and fees, and, and uh, I would move the um, uh, entire budget from uh, the town clerk, that's correct, uh, to incorporate these uh, uh, personnel changes and charges uh, the cost for 39 weeks, 44661.84, and uh, the senior bookkeeper, 39 weeks for 2,676. Is that correct? Am I reading this that right? That's correct. You're right. 85 cents. I would, I would move that budget and those uh, personnel changes uh, with that data. All I would ask, I would just caution the board that, that also in addition, what's not here, is in order to accommodate that additional personnel, there will be some... Uh, Manipulation of the workspace necessary right. uh, in order to accommodate that fourth window, which is, I understand, her goal there. Uh, there is not money currently carried for that, but that's something that's going to be required to do, and I'm sure we'll we'll deal with that. But I just want to put that on the table. Yeah. Yeah. We have a motion, and we have a second. Yeah. 
I'll second, but can I just ask a question first? Sure. Because I'm sorry, but this town clerk assistant full-time and senior book, so those are two new positions. No, the full-time person is a completely new, 100% new right. position. Okay, and then the this other is, is additional for the senior book cook. Correct, keeper. basically it's a promotion. Okay. It's a book. Correct, right. right. In the contract, in the Teamster contract right now, there's a bookkeeper position and a senior bookkeeper. Okay. And so she has someone in the bookkeeper position that she's wanting to promote to the senior book. Correct. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Oh, okay. All right. So, and then we have the paralegal for that's the, the next, question. that's another issue. Yeah, but we do, are we do it, is this, we just do on the town clerk right now? Yeah. Just the town clerk. Okay. Yeah. I'll second the motion. Rick, do you have anything? All right. I have a question and I don't want to put anybody on the spot. That's why we're here. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, I periodically come out and look at what's going on downstairs. And uh, we have a lot of very frustrated citizens coming in to try to register cars and register to vote and do a lot of other things. And that line frequently is halfway across the room. And at the end of the month or the beginning of the following month, it's almost out the doors. So it's very, very long. There are long waits. People are getting very frustrated. We need to do something to solve that time problem. So I think you need to do this. Do you have any thoughts on this? No, I, again, I, we've listened to Jane speak on this, and we absolutely see that. You know, I like to see some high data to show the increase and such, but but it's very difficult for her to produce that data. I had a conversation with her today, but again, anecdotally, we can we can tell you we see it. You know, I get called from time to time when there is a citizen down there who is less than cordial, um, and have to go down and kind of assist with with diffusing some of those. We've definitely seen an increase at least since I've been here in that. Absolutely, um, so. I, I would say this was the number of people there, and again, uh, license and permits. I know permits is in there, but uh, $3.739 million business at those windows. That's a it's big a business. It's a lot. I can, I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the assistant town manager is absolutely correct. Uh, we, in the past, have had maybe one or two people a year that we're having problems with. That That is constantly climbing now because of this aggravation. Happens quite frequently now. Okay. And in, we're voting on the whole budget, then you're saying, Phil? Yes, we're sir. We're voting on her three percent raise. So too. we haven't talked about that. That's an issue again. It's it's you've historically done several things. When it's come through as another elected official, when there's a request in there last year and in other times, this board has just passed that on as a part of the budget. Um, and she can justify or the elected official speak to that. That's a challenge you have with several of the boards here, you know. Right. Um, so that's what you did last year. You can choose to do that or you can choose to do something different with it. It's really a political discussion for you folks to make on that. Um, but 3%, uh, you know, I did some looking today on what her salary is uh, using the old NHMA data, mm. um, and it doesn't seem out of line from what I see in there, absolutely. For the record, Mr. Chairman, the three percent that was requested is sixty-eight thousand eight hundred and fifty-three dollars and sixty-three cents. Any other discussion? No. Well, to All be right. clear, that three percent wasn't that entire number. That's what the new salary would be at the end of the addition of the three percent. Just didn't want to think, you know, right, right. clear on that. That's mm -hmm. what the new salary would be with the three percent. It's currently sixty-one nine nine two. Yep. Um, it would then move up to with the three percent sixty-three eight fifty-three. I would just bucks. Yeah. like to say, since we're discussing about how people act when they're in line, they ought to just pay attention to what happens in another state, because as long as the lines are here, they're nothing compared to when you live in Florida, California, or anywhere else I've ever lived. Or yeah. well, when you got to go to the state. Yeah. Or the DMV, like or, yeah. that, an hour and a half. Yeah. And actually, These lines are nothing. A yeah. lot of people, someone True. had posted about the town, you know, how you can do the registrations online. And I was surprised that a lot of people, I mean, I just saw it on social media that a lot of people didn't know that they could do that. I just saw that, mine today came on my phone. Yeah, if, you already, if you're registering the same vehicle, you don't have to come here. You That's can right. do it all online. Yes. Right. Yeah. And all of that is on our website, and folks are able to do that. The only other thing I, I would say is that Rusty's not here and we're voting on a budget. That's, we're, vote, we're voting on something that we said we were going to get more information from. For. That's the only thing I would say. Joe Call, you're the chairman. You want to postpone it until the next time? Yep. And if I'm out next week, well, we know you're. We don't we? You know my position, right? We know your position. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Got it. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <laughs>
Uh, what do you want to take up next? Uh, legal? Legal. All right. So legal, they were um, added actually at the administrative level. Uh, you get two issues there, the paralegal and the intern. Uh, I'll talk to the intern program first. I think this was a very good ad for us. Um, this year, yeah. uh, Mark was able to recruit a UNH law student uh, to come in uh, and work for free uh, during the summer. Added value, um, and I think it was a good program to expand. Um, and in doing so, we think as we can recruit other people, I think it's a good opportunity to pay an intern to have a more effective working, choose a better candidate, that type of thing. It's a lot of work, and I think that's a reasonable thing to start. The second part, the paralegal, um, that was really in response, as I understand it, from, from the manager, uh, response from some of the board members, given the workload in there. Um, that's a fair amount of money. To add to this budget and you know my position is I know Mark is interested in it my position is paralegal uh, going rate is substantially higher than $25 an hour um, you know it's board's choice I would recommend you know personally my recommendation I've shared this with Mark is that we forego the paralegal this year and expand the intern basically test drive it more with more hours pay somebody that we can count on to be there more consistently and then see how that goes and if that continues to work positively and maybe we consider that paralegal further. All right. And again, we have a space need issue, uh, depending on the number of hours, putting additional people yeah. in there. That's my personal take on it. I don't know if Fred shares that or not. But. He does. Uh, looking at it from uh, the perspective of what you're going to do with a paralegal, uh, if you're going to work that person uh, as a regular employee, you don't have the room. The intern uh, can work around the existing work staff that's up there. We don't have a place for these people to sit unless somebody's out. So maybe we do the intern to start, build on that, and if we need a paralegal at that point in time, we can justify it, then come back to the board with that justification after we do the research and the work. It's a lot of money. Okay. Um, Rick? I agree with what Fred just said. Regina? Well, but is the intern going to be available for what? I mean, I thought the whole point was so that Mark could actually be doing lawyer things and he could have someone in the office doing all the, filing all the motions, doing all the research for him. I mean, you know, I worked as a paralegal for, you pretty much, you, you're an attorney, but you just, you didn't pass the bar. You do all the same work. Right. So I don't think that, I mean, an intern is necessarily going to, I mean, I think it will help them out, but I don't think it's a replacement for a paralegal. I mean, I don't know. I think maybe don't have the intern and have a paralegal. That would be my suggestion. Because I think the budget is still, even with that, it's what, $240,000, the legal budget? And if you yes. add... Yeah. No, it's two twenty five with the paralegal in there and the intern out. Right. It's only mm -hmm. two, it's two twenty five, isn't that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. It's already in there. Yeah. Oh, all right. I think yeah. we should wait till Rusty's here. Well, the the only trouble is, I know Phil has a fairly strong opinion on this one. I believe I, I shouldn't speak for anybody. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I I did, but as you know, there was a reorganization, and now um, legal comes under uh, Mr. Welch. Yeah. And I know I'm, I'm free to say that, but there oh, was yeah. a, there was an organization, and now um, I'm more inclined. Uh, to uh, uh, go with uh, uh, we a looked at it and listen to them. Okay, so would you find wait, us waiting for Rusty? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, okay. Sure. We did look at it, and we, what we found was that the paralegal could only be here half time. And we really need that person full time to do what you want to do, but I got no place to put them physically. Okay. Can we wait on that? Good. Wait on that. Um, uh, proposed increases for elected positions that that's so the elected there. positions you have you have the town clerk tax collector is the same thing both come in and propose to you three percent I think that's a decision for you folks historically you've passed that on when they've given something that that is reasonable yeah. um, I'd suggest you do that here as well then we'll talk about in general there were some other issues that were raised um, for what what did we do with the the real part time folks that these are the folks who are. Uh, worked on the DPW, seasonal laborers doing trash picking. What they have struggled for a significant period of time filling some of those, and we do think that pay is part of that. I think at some points they were nine dollars, eleven dollars, and we were having trouble getting anybody to apply for those positions. 
Um, same with uh, folks to assist in the rec department for the summer with assistance of parks maintenance and that type of thing. So we had a global discussion about what should that number be? You can go to McDonald's and, and work for $15. So we, with some of those positions, we recommended and we put in the budget that they go to $14 is sort of our base minimum there for those types of positions. There are a couple others that may be smaller, but generally that's the number we're recommending. Um, and we've made those adjustments within this budget. I would recommend that we do that. We need to start getting more people in public works in the summer to assist. We need to have more assistance uh, dealing with some of these issues for the parks to be much more effective with some of the great work that's been done to upgrade them. I agree with that. I agree. Uh, we can wait for Rusty and then. Um, yeah, I agree. So the chart there, it just breaks down the number of hours that were in the budget, all the positions, what they're currently being paid for, according to the 17 budget, and then right. the increase for the 18. That's kind of your breakdown. So you guys can see it all right there instead of yep. looking across the budget. Yep. But to be clear, these are true part-time, non-union positions, seasonal, position, even, seasonal even employees, most of them. Yeah. They're all seasonal for this thing here. Yep. So Any other questions that came up regarding wages? Wages, would be happy to answer for you. If not, we can move into tax rate. Tax rate. Zero. Mm. Wasn't it for a while that Alaska got all the money back? No. You still do? You still do? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the oil. Yeah. yeah. That must be nice. Oh, yeah. So, Christy handed out a document that was put together to give um, an overview. I understand there was a discussion in the last meeting with regard to. Uh, what if any number the board would be interested in applying to um, you know reduce the tax rate as the tax rate is set here so Fred sorry if I continue on no please you know? so we've done a couple of things for your information the top portion shows since 2010 what was the municipal portion of the tax rate just to give a history there the second section is estimated tax 2017 tax rate at various uh, 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 milestones currently as you look at the budget uh, six point Five to 652 is what we estimate the impact on this budget would be for our current tax or the budgets we've been the doing for the current budget. 17 budget for what we'd be dealing with. And then the board, I understand, was looking at using some undesignated uh, fund balance to help uh, affect that. Our recommendation at staff is to maintain that at a flat level. And in doing so, you'll see that first one to go back at 641. Uh, it's the estimated rate using 350,000 of unassigned fund balance, which will give us <laughs> level municipal tax rate for this current budget going in. We've also given you other milestones just so you see what further would be. Um, and again, our recommendation is to keep it flat. And the reason for that is to look forward as well to next year, the 18 year, based on this budget to keep two things, keep it down further. What are the recommended, what's the unassigned fund balance? You'll see just below those numbers there. Unassigned fund balance as of 12 31 16, um, and what it is now. And then what the recommendation from DRA is, and what's that range look like based on our budget? So that's what that 2016 fund balance retention guidelines are. It's 17, 10, 8, and 5 percent. Five being the lowest they recommend, 17 is the high they recommend. We also put a note there that, that as the manager came on board, you recall that those numbers were substantially lower. And as Fred likes to always say, there is always a portion of unpaid taxes. It runs just under $2 million, around $2 million right now. His position, and I, I agree with it's good financial management, is that's sort of your basement of zero because that's liability you still have there that we have to pay operating. So that plus the 5%, right around that $5 million is where we recommend be the minimum level. Um, so we'd be happy to answer any questions or clarify any of that. So what we're recommending is that you move 350000 from the undesignated fund or unassigned mm -hmm. fund balance. Am I saying that wrong? Apply. But it, that number could fluctuate once we were start working with DRA. So I would more incline them to recommend what they would like to see the tax rate be, or closer to what the tax rate will be. Because I would tax rate flat. But yeah, to keep. So the if tax we rate said flat. keep the tax rate flat, then you would figure out yes. how much. And it'll probably end up being less than the three hundred fifty thousand would be my guess, or slightly more. But I would right. guess a little bit lower. Would there be any problem with voting like that? No. No. no you're setting a goal. This is what it needs to be. Okay. And and <clears throat> as they go through setting the tax rate, they're manipulating figures based upon information they receive from other state agencies for income and so forth. So that will have a play in this, and they round things out. So it, it will be whatever they decide it will be to keep the rate flat. Okay. Regina? 
So if we took 350 or whatever it was to maintain the 6.41, yes, town portion, and that would bring the fund to balance down to, I don't know, whatever it is, 6.5 something, uh, 6.5 6 something. Yeah. And uh, maybe we could, instead of just using, keep the tax rate flat, and then instead of just applying additional money to offset the tax rate, be a little bit more uh, productive of how we, um, if we have money that maybe we can use for other things that need to be done in the town to work on some of these problems that we really got to start. Right, you could with. choose to use it to, um, in 17, you guys or the board put forward two Warren articles totaling 200000 that came from the unassigned fund balance, so it could right. be used towards Warren right, articles if you, like that. when you write your Warren articles, you can use it for in that manner if you chose to. I think we put 100, I, well, at least when I drafted the Warren articles, I put 150000 of a surplus Already? in there, yeah, to, to, to yeah, offset two Warren articles. Yeah. Uh, the real problem here is that as we go along, and you, you've all read this monster of a report, yeah. uh, we need to find a way to take care of some of those expenses without raising the tax rate and to plug things in so they come in a structured sense as we go along rather than just saying okay let's uh, let's appropriate 30 30 million dollars to go ahead and do this work and wherever it falls it falls i don't think that's good financial planning we need to know what needs to be done when it needs to be done and how it needs to be done it does not have to be done at once we can stretch this out and put it across the period of time and try it. My goal is to try to keep the tax rate flat for five years. If we do it right, we may be able to do that. I would say this, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Uh, uh, just like the uh, folks that came in and briefed on trustees, I'm bullish on this town. I'm bullish on, on the way we're going. I'm bullish on, uh, on leadership, uh, Mr. Welch. Mr. Sullivan, finance and our department heads. And last year, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm reading out of the uh, audit, uh, we committed 1.005000, a million bucks. Yeah. Um, and uh, we meet all the ratios, we exceed all those. Our fund balance is now $6.9 million, is that correct? Yeah. And I, I am more of the ilk uh, that we uh, dedicate uh, like minded monies uh, this year. I'm not rounding it out to the cents because you've got to do your tax calculations, but I'm much more in the uh, seven figure range. Keeps us well within the ratios. You can address some of the uh, concerns that uh, Selectman Barnes has, that it will, will provide a little surplus if my uh, uh, understanding of accounting is accurate. But that's, that's where I'm at. I totally agree. I haven't talked yet. That is exactly what I was going to say. Okay, so totally agree with that there was, should be more. What was it the year before? What, a million bucks. I mean, last year was a million bucks, but what was it the year before? Um, that? It's always, I've no, I don't remember it being been, as low as It's been between five and 500,000 and a million. So 350,000 is a lot less. I'm for more. And you see the numbers attached there that, that set a new goal, whatever the board would like to do, yeah, set been, that as the goal and we'll yeah. adjust? It's usually about six or 600,000. Okay. That's what I kind of remember. Hey, I, I'm more in the keeping the tax rate level, going along with the plan that the finance director, the assistant manager, the manager have come up with, and using the money, some of the money for Warren articles, and, and making sure that we've got money there to use. So I'm, I'm more with going with the plan that they've come up with, and a plan to keep the tax rate level for five years. That's a good I think that's a good plan to go out there and, and tell people that we're not just going to put a lot of money in this year and then maybe next year we don't have that much money to put in, so the tax rate then jumps up. I, I think planning for five years on a tax rate, to me, makes more sense than just worrying about this year's tax rate. And I think they've come up with a good plan to deal with that. Well, here's um, So the unassigned fund balance is just 6.9 if we did a million like we did last year, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, sure. Uh, how is that a fund balance at a threat to go any lower, given our delinquency rate on taxes uh, is a percentage-wise and historically, and we might need the tax collector's input, but I, I, I just see that uh, we should be more aggressive. And, and I would like to know how that UFB is threatened. If we do a million and go to 5.9, I'd like to know, given the economy, last year we did a million, 
and uh, how it grew or didn't grow and uh, answer some of those more general questions. And, and uh, you know, if the board goes to 350 or whatever flat, it's a, it's a good story. And I, it, whatever it is, whether it's flat or whether we reduce it, but please, if you could expound on that. Well, one of the one of the threats, obviously, that hits the town is is how do you spend your money and, and on what? We're going to have forty one million dollars worth interest worth of improvements we need to do to the wastewater treatment plant, which is going to be a humongous bond, one of the biggest bonds this town has ever floated. That's going to be a big principal and interest payment to start off with. If you have the money and surplus and you take money out of surplus, you're committed to reducing the tax rate, which is a grand idea. I, 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 I approve of that. And last year, my recommendation was a million dollars. If we don't have a million dollars next year, because we've got a whole bunch of things that haven't been done yet this year, and we can't put another million dollars in to spend it, then what we do is we keep on cutting the surplus down to the 5%, and then we have nothing in order to put in. And that's wrong. I think we need we need to husband our resources to some level so that we make sure we have, we put a million in this year, we better make sure we're going to put a million in next year because otherwise, if we only have 500000 next year, that rate's going to jump by $500,000. That's going to be an inconvenience to everybody in town. I really don't want to do that. But it's up to the board as to how you spend those funds. You can spend everything down to the 5%. Or everything, actually, everything down Zero. to the unpaid taxes, yeah. and that's what the town was doing when I got here. In fact, you were spending everything, so you, you had you, nothing. You've done a heck of a job, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm more in line last year, but it's a good story, and I'm not upset. Uh, six one half dozen of the other. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's, 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 it's a shoot. I mean, you know, and this is something we have to vote on tonight, right? You do not have to vote <laughs> on it tonight. However, the tax collector informed me today that if we don't have the rate set by Wednesday of this week, then the tax bills will not be due December 1st. So, so in It'll effect, just add we have a day to... Each, each, it adds a day every day yeah. that we don't. So if we so, wait till next Monday, you're out probably till like the 7th or 8th yeah. of December that your tax bills are due. Right. We don't want to set people with... Yeah. Right. It's not yeah. a good Christmas right. 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 You want to stay consistent to when we've done it. Right. Huh? Yeah. You want to stay consistent to when the yeah. bills were expected. Yeah. Yeah. I make a motion that it be 600000 600,000? Yes. Second. Okay, we've had discussion. Anybody want any more discussion? Well, 600. We split the difference. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah that's it. Okay, all that in favor? Opposed? Three to one, passes. All the way reserved. Yep, yeah. well, I was going to say one okay. more thing. <laughs> so we're going to do 600,000 from the unassigned fund balance to help offset the tax rate. Okay, and then like I said, that may fluctuate slightly depending on how all the numbers fall out, but it'll be in that uh, ballpark. And then um, overlay, the last several years we have left that at the 500000 I talked with Fred earlier today and feel that that is appropriate to keep it there. The overlay is used to um, offset abatements from the assessing department. So you need a vote on we that? We need a vote on that too because right. that's a piece of setting so the tax rate. Right. And that's taken into consideration with all these um, numbers you have in front okay. of you. So moved. Second. All in favor? Approved. That's it for finances? Yes? No? That's no, it for the next thing. meeting. No, all right. One more. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I um, heard from Scott Egan, the lead auditor, and he is willing and able to come to the board's meeting on November 6th, if that's appropriate. If not, we can go out further. No, that would be choose. nice, I think, yeah. So good. November 6th is fine with you. I told him I'd confirm in the morning, so. Good, yep. Okay, so he will be here on November 6th. Super. The next thing is vacancy on a, a Hampton Beach Area Commission, and we're going to put that off for a couple of weeks. Uh, not next week, but the week after. Whenever you say, Mr. Chairman, okay. the vacancy doesn't occur until 16 November. Okay, that Thank sounds you. good. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, what is happening? How many people have applied? So far, zero. Well, I got one. No, what? one. No. There was okay. one email today. What are yeah, you making? I got that. I got Mr. Nichols. Okay. No, okay, not Nichols. I didn't get Nichols. Yeah, Mr. Nichols is uh, interested. I okay. think if it's no, a, I don't think it's he. Uh, is it the same email that I saw? He wasn't suggesting that he wow. did it. He oh, was the one I got. The one I got was Mary Louise. Yeah, I got and I would like to discuss what Mr. Nichols' uh, email was. He made a good point, and um, which was he would like to see uh, 
somebody that's not actively involved in business, um, which uh, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> the vast majority of people there, I mean, the state basically doesn't <clears throat> get too involved when something comes up that really pertains to Hampton and this Hampton's business. I mean, they don't, sometimes they abstain from the vote. Um, but there are a lot of people that are uh, representing business and people that are representing the village district, which has a complete business-oriented budget. Um, and I'm not saying I'm against any of that, because I'm not. And I'm very happy with what I've seen happen at the Hampton Area Commission, but I think as long as we're having changes, we need to really take a look at it. May, may I read his email? Yeah. yeah. And I apologize to Mr. Nichols for suggesting that he that he wanted, and, and he clearly states that he doesn't. While I am not interested in filling the opening on the HBAC, I do believe that the Hampton Beach, as well as the town of Hampton, would be better served if the position were filled with someone with a resident's point of view. In my opinion, the HBAC membership has been weighted too heavily in favor of people who have tourism-related business interests or are very sensitive to business interests. Coupled with the HBAC State of New Hampshire membership on the committee, the perspective of people who simply reside at the beach and pay taxes in Hampton has been limited, particularly given the residents represent the vast majority of the people that are impacted by the work of this committee. I don't have any statistics to offer you, but I do believe that the percentage of people with property that is used only by their families and properties used year-round as opposed to rented out in the summer has dramatically has increased dramatically over the 17 years I've lived at the beach. And he goes back to 2013 um, with the same in, intent on that. I think, I, I know he makes a very good point. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, I'm, um, you know, not, I'm very supportive of the Hampton Area Commission. And, but I've seen what's gone on there this year. And there was a lot of time was spent uh, on, for instance, on doing something with Ashworth Avenue. And it was discussed back and forth. In fact, because too much time was spent on that, uh, all consideration was dropped for north of Boar's Head. Right. And they said, well, we, we, we spent too much time discussing this. And there was an, uh, a uh, overwhelming feeling, and I heard it mentioned several times, why are we constant? Why would we want to spend any money on Ashworth Avenue when we have our sh our big road up front? Well, the big road up front isn't where everyone lives. There's a lot of condominiums there, which I think there needs to be more discussion and more of a uh, uh, for these new people that are moving in and spending a lot of money on these condos. They need to be represented more. Um, and you know, I'm. Uh, I'm, when things get decided, I'm all for however it goes, but I do know that because too much time was spent on Ashworth Avenue because people want to just have everything be right up front, which is nothing but business, and it's not just the people that live on all the side streets and everything else, it's just wrong. We, as a board here, had five to one, five, uh, unanimous vote to uh, to include at least to Winniconnet Road, if not to High Street. The, uh, the Beach Precinct was very supportive of that too. All three members, all eight elected members. And yet, because we spent too much time so that we could have our little lady up front, Ocean Boulevard, right in the business area, I think is wrong. And I think we really need to take another look here. And I know that um, uh, Nancy uh, Stiles called me this week because uh, she's down in Florida and um, she's considering putting her name she has not put her name forward yet uh, as I otherwise yeah, would have been told uh, when we just asked that but she is going to watch the meeting tonight and decide uh, if she is going to put her name forward and I uh, I myself am okay with Nancy because I think she's been elected by all the citizens and she's represented at all times um, uh, all residents of Hampton. And I think that's what the Hampton Area Commission is supposed to be doing, spending time 
with everybody. This isn't, it isn't only about experience, Hampton. It isn't only about the Chamber of Commerce. It isn't only about the Village District. But we can be supportive of all of these initiatives. And I think everybody is. And I've never once felt that we're not. But I do think that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Nancy knows all of the problems in Hampton. So I think she's a legitimate uh, candidate, and I hope she puts her name forward. But there might be other people there, too, that have strong feelings. Um, uh, like, I think, you know, that represent the views of the people that live in Hampton everywhere. Okay. Just so people know, I just want to make <coughs> sure that we're accepting, that people can contact anybody on the Board of Selectmen, yeah. the town manager, the assistant town manager, anybody who wants their name placed in nominate to be nominated for this position can contact and should contact if they want. We've had one so far who directly said they wanted to be on, and that was Mary Louise Woolsey. She said to me, so her name is up there. She's one. And if anybody else wants to, please contact somebody and put your name forward. And in two weeks, we will discuss it and go through it. And I, I know that we're having a meeting this week. Um, and I believe that they're just going to appoint, uh, it appears they're going to appoint uh, the other people that want to be reappointed. I mean, the last time we had a... Um, an opening for the at-large person. I think it was, I don't know, it was eight or 11 people or something, a large amount of people that applied. You know, everyone's done a good job there on the board, but, you know, I think that we need some people putting their names forward here, at least. And, and if I may just say something yeah. again to uh, uh, agree with Mr. Nichols' perspective is uh, a, a perfect case, and it, it reemphasizes what what Rick does. And I don't want to talk too much about because I've got a lot of comments to make later. Uh, is the parking lot? The intermodal parking lot with a diesel uh, bus repair facility uh, uh, taking that land and the Hampton Beach Area Commission was all about it and Russell was rightfully up in arms. Uh, the diesel plume would have gone over our uh, athletic fields, it would have gone over where children are playing, their carcinogens and uh, it was all to support business uh, and it's all about the beach and it's all about their business and it had nothing to do with quality of life up here and those things are an eyesore and they're a menace and we've heard testimony about crime but the Hampton Beach Area Commission was all for it and up and this is up town so it doesn't just extend to the beach their their pushing and their efforts have been and it was voted down by this board is uh, um, to uh, expand their geographic imprint and it it really does affect residences and citizens and it's not just about the beach thank you mr. chairman thank you closing comments None? motion to adjourn 2137 Favor. Thank you. 22. Great job.